Good evening, everybody. Myself, Dr. Vishal Dave, Medical Advisor, Intas Pharmaceuticals, based at Head Office, Ahmedabad. It's my honor to coordinate this webinar. The theme of this webinar is the player sperm, with or without care. I would like to introduce now the co-conveners of this webinar. Number one, Dr. Nidhi Singh. She is medical director at Tejasvi Women's Wellness and Maternity Center Varanasi. She is also senior consultant embryologist at Panakia Hospital Varanasi. Next co-conveners is Ms. Shita Tanwar. She is currently working as clinical embryologist at OSS Fertility Center, Banan Shankari, Bangalore, Karnataka. She has previously worked as senior embryology and lab in charge, New Life Indian Fertility Clinic, Private Limited, Delhi. Next co convener is Nancy Sharma. She is senior consultant embryologist at the Department of Reproductive Medicine, Jindal IVF, and Sant Memorial Nursing Home. The last co convener is Dr. B. Nanda Lakshmi. She is first woman from India, certified as reproductive embryologist from American College of Embryology with highest score ever in this exam. Now I would like to hand over the session to Dr. B. Ananta Lakshmi. Over to you, madam. Thank you for your kind introduction. Now let's move on to the meeting message. And I would like to introduce our uh, conveners and the founder of IGDA, Dr. Ved Prakash, sir. Can I have the CV vision? Anta, you can share your screen. Yeah. Is it visible? Yes. The screen. Yeah. Dr. Ved Prakash, sir, he is a, a regional head embryology, Nova South End IVF, and lab director, South End Fertility and uh, IVF. In Delhi, he is the founder of IGRA and past president of ACE India, member of Visual Education. Ananta, 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 next, 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 next uh, uh, founder, uh? co founder is Dr. Sanjay Shukla, sir. She is. Clinical Embryology, Mahatma Gandhi University of Medical Science, Jaipur. He is working in the field of human reproduction since 1998. The next co-founder will be Dr. Charizard Joshi, sir, with the experience of more than 20 years in embryology. He has uh, he is the medical director of Genes India ART Bank Indore and lab director IVF unit RD Gadi Medical College Ujjain. He is a consultant embryologist and co-founder of IGRA. Now I request Dr. Ved Prakash, sir, to introduce the first speaker of the session. Thank you, Ananta. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Sanjay Dumal Satya, and he is assistant professor in embryology and senior clinical embryologist department of Changani Chama IVF Fertility and Reproductive Medicine Center, KS Hagri Medical College, Nitya Deem to be University Mangalore. And uh, now, uh, as you know, we are going to uh, discuss about acrosome. And uh, first, we will start with Dr. Sanket, and Sanket will going to start with uh, all uh, to speak on all about acrosome. So uh, you know, acrosome is very important in fertilization uh, of uh, that uh, fertilization uh, of uh, egg, and to uh, start the beginning of embryo formation and uh, baby formation. You know, so it is very important to know about acrosome how it how it form and uh, what is its function is all about. So over to uh, Dr. Sanket Dumar. Thank you so much, uh, Ved sir, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, firstly, sorry for my bad voice. Uh, I'm since I'm not having a cold, apologies for that. And uh, let me, uh, technical team, please allow me to share the screen. I'm not able to share my screen. Ananda, please stop sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Is it visible now? Yes. Yes.
well uh, as uh, vetsa said yes I, i'll be talking about all about acrosome the webinar today's webinar topic is uh, a player with or without cap so i'll be talking about cap so what does this cap contains and how important it is with respect to fertilization as well as pre implantation embryo development firstly uh, i would like to quote my own uh, uh, statement where uh, since acrosome is per related very much related to morphology of the spermatozoa sperm morphology see over an impressive period of uh, spanning more than 100 million years has preserved evolutionarily conserved in the same way with very minimal modifications which is an illustration of evolutionary stasis having said this well coming to a, a typical or a normal definition of an acrosome the yeah, acrosome is a very unique membranous organelle located over the anterior part of the sperm nucleus that is highly conserved through the evolution so what does this contain this this is like basically an acid vacuole contains a number of hydrolytic enzymes that when secreted helps or enhances the sperm to penetrate the x coat this is like very broad or a layman's uh, language if you say what is acrosome and what it is capable of as a embryologist we let us dig more into this firstly i want to uh, spotify the the where exactly uh, the process or the phase which i'm talking about if you look at the spermiogenesis in humans uh, there has various phases starting from spermatid formation and golgi phase and followed by cap phase and then acrosome phase and the maturation phase flagellation phase and spermiation and finally the maturation that happens in the epididymis and the same the sperm matured sperm which transports to the vas deferens and expelled with the urethra with an ends up in fertilization so i'll be talking about only this part of it uh, which is acrosome phase where the acrosome formation happens so basically this mammalian sperm acrosome performs two principal exocytosis dependent functions first is to serve as a site for sequestration and release of the proteins that that are required for binding to the for binding as well as penetration of the zona pellucida once it is achieved the next function would be uh, making the sperm enable to fuse with the vulva so these are the two uh, principal or uh, fundamental exocytosis dependent functions that mammalian sperm performs having said that well uh, this is a very broad statement that i'm going to give here because this is very contradictory as well as uh, which is much very much uh, 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 proven as well as accepted the acrosome basically is a golgi derived secretory organelle with a cap like structure covering the anterior part of the sperm head of the most animal sperms similarly this is formed during an early stage of spermiogenesis and resembles the cellular lysosome see we just spoke about golgi derived secretory organelle now i'm saying that it resembles the cellular lysosome which is a bag like structure that normally functions in intracellular digestive and autophagy autophagy mechanisms but in mammals if you look at the shape and size yes this is uh, highly variable across uh, various species in the especially in mammals which basically depends on the morphology of the sperm head i'm saying the acrosome the size and shape is uh, varies from species to species and is mainly dependent on the morphology of the sperm head and also the underlying nuclear morphology so based on the underlying nuclear morphology and the sperm head morphology the determination of this acrosome size and shape happens and the shape of the acrosome is quite variable between species and uh, say ranging from skull cap or pedal shaped or spatulate in several several uh, large mammals to a contrary where we can see we get to see sickle shaped uh, uh, acrosome or head shape in rodents and in most mammalian species the sac like structure of the acrosome basically consists of two parts the anterior uh, region as well as the equatorial region and it is basically surrounded by two membranes that is one is inner acrosomal membrane as well as outer acrosomal membrane and finally this inner and outer outer acrosomal membranes surround the very electron dense content of the acrosome which is basically the uh, granule or, or or the zone which contains the 
hydrolytic enzymes which are essential for acrosome reaction as well as the fertilization process. If you look at the schematic illustration of a developing spermatid, uh, it, as I said, it has autosomal, outer acrosomal membrane, where you can see here, for, and it has the inner acrosomal membrane, and it has the acrosomal granule, which encloses and uh, composed of all this uh, enzymes, proteases or hydrolytic enzymes and, uh, uh, and, and, and the cargo, which is involved in the acros which is involved in the fertilization process. And this is the acro, this is the acroplaxome, which connects across, this is spread across the uh, acrosome as well as the nucleus, nucleus head, which helps in attaching the acrosome to the nucleus. This is all about, if you look at a uh, 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 dorsal or uh, uh, cross-sectional view of a uh, spermatid, and well, uh, coming to uh, different uh, types of uh, 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 head morphologies and acrosome, uh, re acrosomal regions, see the, the one which is shaped in a gray color is uh, acrosome region, and the one uh, which is denoted by a dashed outline is a nucleus. Okay, so having said this, see Homo sapiens to uh, impala, uh, which includes bull as well as uh, a whale, have a very skull shaped or, uh, or, or spatulate kind of acrosome as well as head. But look at this. This is on the contrary, you can see a huge difference with respect to the mouse as well as rat acrosome as well as sperm head region. The morphology entirely, it is like almost sickle cell shaped here in, in, in case of rat. And also look at the chicken, uh, how it is a very small, tiny region, similarly with sea urchins and also the living fossil, one of the living fossils uh, that is uh, uh, turbochulus, where the acrosum region is very much limited and it has only a small portion of it and the mechanisms involved, how it is involved in the fertilization process is still a, a different topic of a discussion, which we're not going into the details. Having said that, look at this, it looks like a man with a cap, right? This as well as this, in the guinea pig as well as in uh, 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 chinchilla, it looks like a proper man with wearing a cap or the hairstyle. Anyways, uh, if you look at the schematic representation of the phases of acrosome biogenesis in mouse, it is broadly categorized into four phases. One is uh, Golgi phase, which encompasses one, two, three uh, uh, steps, and cap phase, which has four to seven, and the acrosome phase, which has uh, say eight to 12, and finally the maturation phase, which has steps from 13 to 16. Well, uh, we spoke about uh, the acrosome, and what about the genesis? So acrosome is uh, derived from the Golgi apparatus or the lysosome related organelle, still, uh, still a question mark, right? So well, let's discuss about uh, uh, the origin of this acrosome. So can, uh, can uh, the delegates as well, I mean, uh, the participants and the uh, faculty can just quickly comment, what do you think about uh, the genesis of the acrosome? Do you think it is acrosome uh, uh, derivative, uh, Golgi derivative? or it is lysosomal related organelle. I'll give uh, 15 seconds to quickly comment. It could be wrong also, no, no problem. Just uh, share me your opinion, whatever you feel, whether this acrosome is Golgi derivative or it is lysosome related organelle. Hope uh, we got some uh, responses. Well, let's deal one by one. If you consider this acrosome as a direct Golgi derivative, there is a uh, plethora of uh, evidence which says that yes, this it could be a Golgi derivative. A lot of research has been conducted and a lot of points which support that this is a Golgi derivative. Let's see what are those points. So, release of this acrosomal contents during acrosome reaction raised questions about acrosomal substance and synthesis as well as the storage. So researchers focused on investigating a biosynthetic pathways, particularly those related to trans Golgi network, that is TGN, or broadly called as TGN network. And with the help of immunocytochemical techniques, which were used to examine the synthesis, the target and the fate of these acrosomal proteins along with the lysosomal and the Golgi markers, what they found is, some acrosomal associated proteins were found to be spermatocytes lacking acrosomes and later transported to the acrosome. And also, 
this uh, the findings the research also suggests that the notion that acrosome is directly derived from the golgi complex serving as a source both for the membrane and the protein contents so what the uh, research is saying that is the uh, the the acrosome is a golgi derivative golgi complex derivative because golgi complex serves as a source for the membrane i just mentioned about the membranes of acrosome right iam and oam inner inner acrosomal membrane as well as outer acrosomal membrane so this golgi complex is serving as a source for this membrane and also the content the hydrolytic enzymes which are involved in the acrosome this will this, this is serving golgi complex is serving as a source for this protein contents and also investigations into the origin trafficking and sorting of this acrosomal proteins revealed novel roles such as acrosins activation by acrolysin and its involvement in the acrosomal content release as well as there is a lot of contradictory data which uh, says that which was found that including the detachment see if you look at the scapping phase it is like a multi multi uh, step uh, process where there will be like golgi apparatus uh, where uh, during the late capping phase and the presence of uh, this is detached during the uh, capping phase. This Golgi apparatus is detached from the growing spermatozoa, which says that it could not be source of uh, 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 acrosome, which, which it cannot form a source of acrosome. Now, also, despite a lot of conflicting reports, a majority of the reproductive research community continues to support the very idea that acrosome is a direct Golgi derivative. These are the references. And coming to another school of thought where some researchers and some scientists still think that is a lysosomal derivative, which has an evidence to where lacrosome is essential for fertilization, which contains acid hydrolytic enzymes facilitating, I'm repeating the statement, acid hydrolytic enzymes facilitating the acrosome reaction and oocyte covering dissolution. Similarly, initial research identified that Hyaluronidase and other hydrolytic enzymes in the acrosomes, suggesting they are modified lysosomes evolved for fertilization. They are modified lysosomes evolved for fertilization. And also, acrosine is a well characterized protease, but its location within the acrosome remains debated, which is another point to debate. Where well, Golgi, uh, the studies which are based on Golgi apparatus uh, uh, with respect to acrosome uh, origin or genesis, which clearly says that acrosome is very much there in the acrosome, but the location, the spatial temporal, the spatio temporal expression of this protein, the protease, uh, remains debated. And despite this, another point to suggest is uh, the gene knockout uh, uh, models or technology revealed that acrosine is not essential for fertilization challenging the very idea that acrosome is a modified lysosome. And contrary research also suggests that acrosome may have originated from the autolysosome rather than a lysosome alone. First, sorry. Yeah. So uh, initially there was a there was a discussion that there is a Golgi derivative. Then the point came in where it is considered as a lysosomal derivative. Now research also suggests that it is a not only lysosomal derivative alone but it is auto lysosome rather than lysosome alone with which because this is uh, proven with the evidence having that this cargo contains the proteins like cert1 as well as tbc uh, 1d20 which was which is involved in acrosome biogenesis and autophagic regulation similarly the differences between acrosomes and uh, secretory granules uh, in other cells, such as presence of this serine proteinases and the differences in granular docking and exosurfaces also were noted. So this transformation uh, pro-acrosomal vesicles into vesicle matrix through protein attachment and as well as the involvement of autophagy in pro-acrosomal vesicle transport or fusion were also discovered. So having said that, like say this, there is a plethora of data which suggests that this is the origin of this acrosome could be of a Golgi uh, uh, derivative or it could be a lysosomal derivative, but there is no clear cut consensus whether these are that. And there's also another point of uh, 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 another school of thought where it can be uh, autosome, auto lysosome origin as well, or it could be complex of all, or, or it could be like a merger of all these organelles. So which still the research has to answer. That, that's what this is. These are that the, with respect to acrosome, the, with respect to acrosome biogenesis, the origin of the sperm acrosome has been a subject of research and debate in the field of reproductive biology. 
initially it was believed that the spermatrosome was modified lysosome due to the presence of these acid hydrolytic enzymes. As I said, right, which we get to see in the lysosomes. In acrosome also, you get to see acid hydrolytic enzymes. Also, the similarities in the pH between acrosome as well as lysosomes suggest that it could be probably originated from lysosome. However, a most recent uh, research also challenged this view, saying that the sperm atrosome may not be a direct uh, derivative of a lysosome, but could be originated from an autolysosome, a structure involved in autophagy. But for me, if you ask me the data which I went through, uh, starting from my bachelor degree, uh, the Gilbert, the, the Lowdish cell biology, more or I feel that this sperm capping, whichever happens, uh, the acrosome capping happens, is of derived from the Golgi apparatus because the evidence suggests that Golgi apparatus plays a significant role in the formation and the transport of acrosomal proteins and as well as enzymes, supporting the very idea that acrosomes, at least the part of the acrosome, is derived from the Golgi complex. And also, in summary, the exact origin of the sperm acrosome is still a topic of research and discussion and also debate. And, uh, and it may not fit neatly into either these or that category, but it appears to involve a complex and cellular processes, including Golgi-related pathways or trans-Golgi network pathways and also autophagy-related mechanisms. I've, I've just put this table uh, just to compare the differences uh, or the, the similarities and differences between the acrosome as well as sperm acrosome as well as uh, the cells which are involved in exocytotic or secretive granules. Like if you look at first, we look into the similarities, which uh, respect to similarities, the sperm acrosome and uh, exo exocytotic cells have few things in common, where the secretive components in co which are in common are AM67. Yeah, also, it is the same AM67. But here, exocytosis enzymes in common are present here, present here as well. And uh, so, serine uh, uh, proteinases also present in both of them. Well, coming to the differences, uh, this number, uh, single one, number of secretory granules with respect to the sperm acrosome is single here. He, but whereas here, in case of exocytotic cells, it is numerous. And uh, with respect to docking, uh, it is undocked here, it is docked. And exocytosis once, once it is done, it is done. No more space for another round of exocytosis with respect to sperm acrosome. But here it is, it can undergo multiple times of exocytosis. Maybe the cargo, uh, the reservoir is more here with respect to uh, 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 the acrosome. And regeneration or replacement, no, it cannot be replaced or regenerated with respect to sperm acrosome. Here it can be replaced or reproduced. And membrane recycling, no. Once it is ruptured, done. No, no more uh, uh, ligating the membrane here. But here it is recycled. And also the various proteins that are involved in acrosomal biogenesis uh, play a very uh, significant role uh, in the very biogenesis of the acrosome, which are broadly categorized into four processes. Uh, starting from C, if you look at it, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, a lot of vesicles have been uh, the cargo of vesicles, the proteins or uh, whatever the molecules which are involved in the biogenesis has been uh, uh, traffic. The, the, you can see a very clear cut trafficking between Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and, and also, you can see a trafficking between Golgi apparatus and uh, the nucleus which is forming. Here, it contains uh, the proteins like HRV, SMAP2, PIC1. ATG7, VPS 113B, and P125, which will form the proacrosomal granules, will later form acrosomal granule, and with the help of acroplaxome, it is going to attach across the nucleus in the developing mature spermatozoa. As I said, they are broadly classified into four processes that is, vesicular formation, vesicular trafficking, vesicular fusion, and finally, acrosome binding to the nucleus. And yeah, these are not going to detail. I've just put a, a since I discovered about the uh, 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 discussed about the uh, biogenesis of the acrosome, a lot of proteins are involved here, right? So, what happens if there is a mutation in one of the gene which is responsible for the formation of any particular protein which is involved in the biogenesis of acrosome? Or, suppose, say, truncated protein is formed because of mutation in the particular gene which is responsible for this kind of these proteins which are involved in the uh, uh, biogenesis of acrosome. And if you categorize them by vesicle uh, stage wise, vesicle formation and trafficking, if there are multiple proteins are involved, and they say, for example, heat shock protein uh, 90B1, if anything goes wrong with this, uh, the function of this protein is mainly the poles degrades and activates the ER proteins, it's endoplasmic reticular proteins. The phenotype will be globosomia. 
this I'm not going to deal in discuss because uh, we have followed a followed lecture on this. Uh, what happens without cap? What happens if the cap is abnormal? And followed up uh, a panel discussion which elaborately discusses about this uh, abnormality of this cap. And anyways, uh, these are the proteins which are involved: GBA2 and GOPC, HRB, and uh, CERT1, ATG7, which almost end up in global azospermia, which is very much directly related to the infertility. And with respect to vesicular function, also there are some proteins which are involved, like say proactosomal granule trafficking, which ends up in chromosomia with respect to PIK1 and GM130. And same with the anchor of this, when this acrosome, uh, uh, the proacrosome is anchoring to the nucleus, uh, there are some proteins which are involved there, say DPY19L2 and ZTB1 and uh, SPARK1, which also helps in, which anything goes wrong with this helps in, I mean, uh, ends up in globosomia or Acrosomal scrap or disrupted uh, acrosome acroplaxome or failure of acrosome thinning. And if you look at the uh, uh, common features of acrosome and lysosome, enzymes in common, which will be like hyal uh, if you compare both acrosome and lysosome, hyaluronidase you can see you get to see in both. And as well as proteinases, where here acrosin is very much prominent with respect to acrosome, and uh, esterases and uh, neuraminidase, which is very common here in the both of them, and acid phosphatases. And the, 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 the pH is here is acidic and same with respect to lysosome. And the origin also, that is from originated from the Galga apparatus, same with respect to lysosome also. Now, this is a schematic representation of biogenesis of acrosome, uh, uh, which is proposed, where they say this is formed by, uh, this is a proposed model where they get to say that uh, this TGN is trans Golgi networks form the, the, the pro acrosomal structures, which finally end up in a acrosome, which is conserved, evolution conserved across the species, depending upon the shape of the head as well as the shape of the nucleus. And also they, they propose that there is some crosstalk that happens between the uh, other multivesicular bodies which are involved here, which has something to contribute to this pro-acrosomal complex finally ends up in the acrosomal granule. Well, coming to take home message, yeah, uh, the origin of acrosomes remains uncertain but it is suggested that they might have originated in simple eukaryotes like yeast, which also form structures resembling those acrosomes during mating. And the existence of true acrosome can be linked to the evolution of uh, heterogamy, heterozygosity, and cross-fertilization as protective coverings around the eggs, uh, which develop to ensure the integrity of the gamete, leading to the need for the right sperm to process the powerful weapon of the acrosome. And as the earth circumstances changed, acrosomes evolved as a part of the arms race between sperms and eggs, which helps to overcome the, the, the protective gamete vestments, that is in case of humans, that is zona pellucida and ulema. And research into acrosomal biogenesis still continues with the idea that the acrosome may be the result of the combination of this multiple multi-membrane trafficking systems during the gamete fusion, representing a complex and evolving secretary vesicle, which is the current research still focusing on. Finally, yeah, this is my own uh, quote where I've written as like, XE is like injecting 3 million DNA base pairs and additional 5,200 sets of mitochondrial DNA and centrioles and epigenetic marks, uh, microRNAs, proteins, and above all, a big hope of fertilization. Now I want to reframe this statement because I missed out this uh, acrosome, which contains a huge cargo of uh, hydrolytic enzymes. And once these are injected in, into the cytoplasm of the oocyte, what is the fate of this? Nobody knows. So having said that, I, I conclude my talk here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Sanket. It was a wonderful talk. Actually, there's so much to learn about acrosome. As you told so many things about biogenesis and everything. Uh, you know, we still, we are not in a uh, actually state that we actually, we don't know about so much about that acrosome is holding that kind of things, information in, in a, uh, uh, itself. So uh, there is one simple question from you because you talk about the genesis and everything. Only yes, one simple question. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. So Sanket, there is only one simple question because uh, I know uh, there will be so many uh, students also we, who are uh, talk, uh, listening our talks and uh, uh, just I want to know about that. Uh, just uh, one question from you. That what about the morphology? Does it matter? Acrosome morphology does it matter? 
uh, yes, or sir. it will leads to, uh, does it leads to any kind of uh, uh, you know genetic problem uh, if uh, that uh, morphology is bad of uh, person like that yeah so to answer this question uh, it is slightly uh, debatable as of now because uh, in my talk also I explained that the acrosome sheet which is going to form has a very specific species specific to attach to the nucleus uh, 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 it has to be a certain shape and uh, uh, size otherwise the aproloxum uh, the acroloxum will not support it otherwise there will be no attachment and end up in like we we're going to talk about globosus pamia with uh, we have callus here and we have uh, 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 a beautiful panel which is lined up so yes this is very much species specific and any faulty in any of the proteins it is a huge like maybe 100 to 200 proteins which are involved in this uh, capping of this acrosome with respect to the humans and, and mouse model but any fault in any one of the genes will end up in abnormal capping of the acrosome which will end up in the infertility this is my uh, view sir thank you any other questions i think uh, uh, like so can i can i ask one yes, question yes 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 yeah. okay please uh, uh, hello dr sanket uh, a wonderful talk as yeah. usual uh, just to extend the point what Dr. Ved has said just now. Okay. See, we are speaking about so much about morphology. It's again about morphology. It's like since different morphologies across different species, so which is highly conserved. probably which is highly conserved. Yes, uh, there was one of the first slides you have said it is highly conserved right from the beginning. So are we overemphasizing the morphology part? I mean, see, morphology is important. We know that it's normally is required. Definitely gives a better fit. But are we overemphasizing the need for a normal morphology. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I got your question, Dr. Akash. But the point here is like, with the advent of XC, nothing is overlooked. Since we are bypassing the very uh, the very need for uh, to penetrate for the usage of this, uh, this enzymes which are involved in acrosome and uh, with respect to the morphology of acrosome. But I, at least uh, we all know that most of the people are doing XC nowadays. And uh, with the advent of XC, I think, this questions uh, this question uh, slightly uh, appears to be uh, invalid what do you say about it uh, i would i would say that you still have globosus permia where it's uh, purely related yeah. to acrosome and fertilization process as such probably it's hmm. the one which is the best characterized one what sure. everyone knows about but uh, uh, what about the borderline cases what about the cases where you see probably an elongated acrosome kind of thing elongated head so in the that's my exact question in the era of ICSI, are we overemphasizing the need for a normal morphology especially in terms of acrosome i feel yes so that means we should not be doing morphology then with respect to acrosome yes, oh, no. <laughs> i think see overemphasizing and uh, uh, looking at it at a, at a, at a very uh, 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 to one to a certain extent could be acceptable right that's what i meant yes 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 uh, i agree yeah, that question from from Pranay, sir. we'll take the question no. from it's not a question, it's just a comment on what Sanket said and probably uh, he said that uh, uh, nothing is overlooked in the era with the advent of ICSI and I perhaps would have to strongly disagree because I think that everything is overlooked. <laughs> everything is overlooked. All you need is a life sperm, you see. Uh, if you ask half of the people who are doing ICSI, uh, I should not be making any judgments or comments, but you know, uh, Acrosome uh, uh, assessment, acrosome reaction assessment, everything takes a backseat when uh, you have uh, the facility of doing XC, uh, especially for non male factor infertility. So, half of the people, uh, I'm just throwing a random number here, people would not e even be aware of uh, what is the point of doing acrosome reaction and uh, 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 for challenge tests and these uh, the uh, things that we'll be probably discussing in the second lecture and the panel. And uh, perhaps, and people would. Uh, uh, still think that uh, when we are doing XC, we are in, uh, injecting a sperm with intact acrosome, another misconception. So I think we are overlooking a lot of things when we are doing XC. So uh, perhaps with more government funded uh, cycles and uh, with uh, a shift to only indicated XC and uh, uh, reworking our way towards conventional inseminations, perhaps a test like acrosome reaction uh, uh, would be a measure of a fertilization potential, especially when we know that uh, normosospermic samples uh, uh, do not uh, have any concordance with regards to fertilization potential. Yeah, so, yeah. just what uh, just to extend what Pranay has just mentioned is, so look at the very new manual, which we got a very new manual, right? WHO 20, uh, 20 manual, which is uh, sixth edition of WHO, 
which had discarded this very own acrosome reaction, which was at least in the experimental phase in the earlier, uh, uh, earlier uh, versions, but now they're not considering it. But so this is like so much of uh, contradicting data and practice has been uh, uh, what we get to see because see, nobody sees the acrosome size. We just see the head shape, right? That's and we're not right. measuring the acrosome size and we even don't know the origin as of now because this is like very much neglected area, I would say, because uh, still, I, I, mean, I cannot say very much neglected area, but uh, still research is going on where uh, this, the importance of uh, the, uh, the genesis of this uh, acrosome and as Pranay said, the reaction, how important it is to check the acrosome reaction, whether, again, this is not qualitative test, I would say, this is a, a quantitative test, I would say, because we're not checking the sperm's acrosome reaction per se, per ICSI, per oocyte, we're not checking the acrosome reaction and we're injecting. We're just blindly looking at the morphology, right? So I would say still we are far away from that. Can I add something, please? Yeah, that's yes. cool. Yes, yeah, uh, wonderful lecture, Dr. Sanket. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Insightful, because uh, I missed the very initial portion about the uh, uh, how the acrosome is derived. If I may add, uh, well, it could be both because it the structural derivation and the functional. Because yeah. lysosome, as we know, that it is it deals with the enzymes, digestive enzymes. So functional aspect probably comes from the lysosome, and the structural derivation could be from the Golgi, Golgi because of the Golgi, the granules, the vesicles. They help in forming the uh, membrane. Membrane, membrane uh, right? Um, so I mean, this is just a stray uh, statement. Uh, while you were uh, giving your lecture, it just occurred to me that of course it could be in conjunction. Because structural and functional together, uh, that is how Golgi and lysosomes together could be involved. And yes, I agree with uh, Dr. Pranay that with the advent of ICSI, rather we are overlooking a lot of the sperm aspects. Of, uh, we are just targeting a live sperm. Forget morphology, forget motility, forget everything else. We are just targeting the uh, life status of the sperm. So yes, we really need to look into all these aspects to understand the basic phenomena. In While doing all this, we are forgetting the basic pathways and phenomena which, uh, in under, which take us towards understanding these um, all these uh, um, phenomena, actually. Yes. So, thank you so, so much rightly, for a wonderful lecture. So rightly uh, said, yeah. ma'am. Uh, thank you, Sanket sir. So we can go forward. I request Vet sir to please introduce the second speaker of the day. So Sanjay is there, if he can. Sanjay sir, to, I request Sanjay sir to please introduce the second speaker. Sir is there? Can do that. You need to begin. Yes, so our second uh, speaker is Dr. Alija Kalis. He's a biomedical science. Uh, he's done biomedical sciences, and he right now he can. Andology Technical Officer, Genia Park, Western Australia, where he worked primarily with semen diagnostics and sample preparation for leading ART, including IVF, ICSI, and IUI. And he has done Bachelor of Science Honours, Biomedical Science, MODAC, University of Australia, under the supervision of Dr. Jim Pao, Piao, Associate Professor Murray Admin, and Professor Ross Decker. And he's done Bachelor of Science Pathology and Lab Medicine in Management. And he's interested in human biology extend to physical health. So he's going to speak on no uh, cap rumor, uh, removal, no fertilization, and uh, capistation and acrosome reaction. Over to Dr. Elijah Kalis. Uh, Hello, Dr. Uh, share the screen. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Let me just see if this is all right. So um my my talk won't be as technical as the previous speaker, so forgive me for that, but Let's go. So the title is Unlocking the Mysteries of Reproduction, Capacitation and Acrosome Reaction for Natural Fertilization and ICSI in the Absence of Cat Removal. Okay. So just a brief overview of what I'll be talking about. So I'll just give a quick um, 
explanation of natural fertilization, then capitalization, cap removal, the acrosome reaction, ART and ICSI, and then I'll conclude. So in general, fertilization is the combination of um, the sperm and the oocyte. So the nuclear fuse um, to create the, the diploid uh, zygote. Um, and so the sperm has half the genetic material and the egg has half the genetic material prior to the combination to form uh, the zygote. So ovulation as when the oocyte is released and swept into the uterine tube. Um, and so fertilization has to occur within 72 hours um, of this process uh, because the oocyte can't survive um, for longer than that for this journey. Um, and the oocyte is surrounded by two protective layers. Uh, the inner layer is the zona pellucida and the outer layer is the corona radiata. And for, so for natural fertilization, um, hundreds of millions of sperm are released into the vaginal canal um, and the environment is quite acidic and has a lot of uh, barriers and obstacles. So only a few thousand sperm actually reach the uterine tubes uh, to possibly encounter the oocyte and capitalization prepares sperm for fertilization. So what is capacitation? process where fluids in the female reproductive tract prepare sperm for fertilization. Uh, this improves the motility of the sperm, thins the membrane of the sperm's head, so uh, the acrosome cap, enables sperm to release the lysosomal enzymes needed to penetrate the oocyte. And so just a bit of more of a further explanation. So the corona radiata cells release the chemical attractants um, to attract the sperm to swim toward it, towards it. Um, and the surviving sperm who undergo the reaction, they reach the oocyte in response and they burrow into the corona radiata and bind to the receptors in the zona pellucida to initiate the acrosomal reaction. And so the acrosomal reaction releases the, the digestive enzymes that clear the path through the zona pellucida for the sperm to reach the, the oocyte. And so hundreds of sperm help degrade the two layers until one sperm is able to, to fuse with the, the plasma membrane and fertilize the oocyte. And so this is just a bit more of a little overview. So there's a cat-like vesicle structure called the acrosome. Um, and that is just, I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse here, but it's just uh, at the tip of the, the head of the sperm, just above the nucleus. Um, and so once that combines with the uh, the corona radiata, uh, the enzymes are released, which help um, facilitate the fertilization. Um, so this reaction is essential for fertilization. Um, it's a bit unknown at the moment how it completely works, but it is sort of known that it is quite crucial. And so there's just a little model here sort of further demonstrating um, how it functions and the steps involved. And so with ART, um, the female patients have the ovary stimulated so they can release some eggs. Um, the eggs are collected, the sperm's prepped and the fertilization occurs um, by the embryologist in the lab. And so the embryo is developed and monitored and cultured, and then eventually it's transferred into the uterus of the female patient for um, implementation and hopefully the development of the fetus. And so ICSI is a more specialized version of IVF, which I'm sure most people here watching and everyone watching understands that process. So I'll just give a quick little um, explanation of that. So a single sperm is selected. It's a more specialized form of IVF. Um, and that sperm um, is collected from the male. Uh, it's directly injected into the eggs. Um, and usually the, 
the eggs will undergo some treatment to bypass all the other reactions um, required um, in natural fertilization. So in conclusion, the acrosome reaction is a crucial step during the gamete interaction in all species, including man. It allows spermatozoa to penetrate the zona pellucida and fuse with the oocyte membrane. Spermatozoa unable to undergo the acrosome reaction will not fertilize intact oocytes. Um, and so with that being said, uh, during the process of ICSI, um, the embryologists can strip the oocytes, they can remove some of the cells, they can uh, do some things to penetrate and bypass those barriers that the acrosome reaction is normally required to do so. Um, so it may be possible um, if the sperm is uh, has a poor form of morphology or some complications with the acrosomal cap uh, for fertilization to occur in ICSI, there is a possibility of that. All right, that's all I have for today. Thank you for listening. Um, any questions? Thank you, Alijan. Uh, it is very uh, short and uh, thing. Uh, so, uh, is there any questions from Sanket? Can you check there? I request uh, Eliza, please, uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. That's okay. Raja, can you uh, uh, tell us more about that uh, exosome reaction? Uh, how it starts, actually? Yeah, so uh, the sperm is uh, signaled to travel towards the oocyte, and there is um, inter when it reaches the oocyte, there's an interaction with the corona radiata that sort of signals it um or signals the sperm to uh break down the head um surrounding the cap to uh that interaction stimulates the 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 change in structure of the acrosome cap which then sort of releases the enzyme so it's it's based on the interaction between the um corona radiata and the the uh, the cap could you, sir, please switch on your camera? Better, you also, please, could you switch on cameras? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so, Dr. Bindu, you are here. Uh, so, uh, uh, would you like to add something uh, with that exosome reaction? Uh, you, are, you are muted, actually. Please unmute. Okay. Uh, well, let us wait for the panel because we have a question regarding acrosome uh, reaction in actually, that so you know, i think uh, it would be better yeah yeah if the... yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> there any questions <coughs> so well explained i think so so we will go further with the panel sir i request nancy to please come forward and uh, introduce thank our you. moderators uh, okay. and i thank uh, Elijah kale sir for his wonderful lecture Thank you. So after this uh, wonderful lecture, we are moving towards the next segment of the evening. That is a that is going to be a very engaging uh, panel discussion with a ex with the expert of embryo it's with the expert of panelists and moderators. For moderation, we have with us Dr. Bindu Chimote. Uh, IVF she mm -hmm. is IVF scientist and consultant clinical embryologist. Madam is MSc mm -hmm. biochemistry, uh, MPhil and PhD in reproductive biology, and MSc. Uh, clinical embryology. She's presented 17 original research papers as first author. Nancy, and 43... you can skip, please. <laughs> so, it's okay. Everyone knows yeah. about Madam and uh, she is uh, very well known in her field. Madam has also presented many, one best paper in travel training uh, award in ASRM 2013. She does not need any sort of introduction. I welcome you uh, on board, ma'am. With her, we have uh, Dr. Rahul Sen, uh, 
consultant embryologist and in Neelkanth IVF Jaipur. He's executive member of ACE 2022 mm -hmm. and 2020, uh, from 2022 to 2024. Nominated as mentor in ASHRAE mentorship pro program in 2022 mm -hmm. and 23 batch. He's also treasurer of SR uh, Rajasthan chapter and uh, past executive member of IFS Rajasthan chapter. I welcome both the moderators and uh, I would request the moderators to please call upon the panelists. Rahul, please. <clears throat> Rahul, are you there? Rahul, Rahul? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Yeah, please. Uh, am, am I audible? Yes. Ye yes, ma'am. <clears throat> getting, uh, getting the connection. Then, yes. <clears throat> so let me just uh, start introducing the uh, panelists. We have for the, the panel discussion, we have Dr. Vijay Mangoli with us, mm -hmm. sir is lab, laboratory director of fertility clinic and IVF center in Mumbai. He's associated with the human IVF since 1986. The Secretary General of uh, ISAR <coughs> from 2009 to 2021. He's also Chairperson Embryology ISAR from 2014 to 2016. Uh, he has published many uh, <coughs> papers in national and international conferences. Is the recipient of Lifetime Achievement uh, Award in 2017. One of the earliest and most experienced of embryologists in our country. Yes, Welcome, definitely. sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I welcome you, sir. Now we have with us uh, uh, Dr. Charulata Ch Ch Chatterjee. She is a uh, scientific head and consulting embryologist, 49 Fertility Center. And uh, Madam has a total of 29 years of experience in the field of med medical and diagnostics and in ART. Field, <coughs> a ART. She is top class experience of 21 years. Uh, of we'll let go. Uh, we'll continue with something. Uh, so if, yeah, yeah, please yeah, so, skip that. So I, I welcome you, ma'am. Thank uh, you. Madam has also many publications in many journals. <laughs> and she is one of the most uh, achieved uh, embryologists in uh, India. With her, we have... Uh, <coughs> Mr. Dilip Kumar, he's associated, associate <coughs> director in embryology operations of uh, an embassy in my, uh, biochemistry, fellowship in clinical embryology. He's working as an associate director in embryology mm -hmm. operations, Milan Fertility and Birthing Center. He is faculty member of uh, in International Institute for Training and Research in Rep Reproductive Health. He's also executive member for, for ACE India, executive member in IFS Karnataka chapter. I welcome you, sir. Uh, now we have with us uh, Dr. Pranay Ghosh. Sir is uh, MBBS MS uh, Obzingai from Mulana Azad Medical College. He's diploma in uh, reproductive medicine, University of Kyle, Germany. He's ASHRAE certified clinical uh, embryologist and topper of the year 2016. He's executive committee, executive member of uh, Indian Fertility Society and uh, Academy mm -hmm. of Clinical Embryologists. I welcome you, sir. Thank you, Nancy. Now we have with us Dr. Parag Nandi, uh, sir is scientific director and clinical embryologist, Cradle Fertility Center, Kolkata. He's former research fellow of University of Kolkata, currently uh, and the founder and founder life member of uh, ACE, ACE India, life member of uh, ISAR and ISAR Bengal local chapter, uh, life member of IFS, organizing and Scientific Committee Member of ISAR 2018 Kolkata, uh, Organizing Secretary ACE 2021 Kolkata, and uh, National Co-Convener Special Interest Group of Embryology IFS, ISAR Member of uh, National Accreditation Committee for ART Center. I welcome you on board, sir. So now I want to hand over the session to the moderators. Rahul, are you there? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I'm here. Uh, shall I share or are you sharing? Ma'am, uh, can you please uh, share? Yeah. So yeah. Can you see? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. Okay. <clears throat> Rahul, you can. 
first of all, I mean, before Rahul starts with the introduction, I would like to say uh, many thanks and congratulations for IHERA for coming up with such wonderful and unique topics. I mean, you take up every uh, topic in detail. So that's really very uh, good and very encouraging uh, for new embryologists. So thank you so much. And at the outset, thanks to Rahul. He was the master chef today. I mean, he has prepared all the slides. I have just tried to do some garnishing as an assistant. So there you are, Rahul. Go ahead, please. Ma'am, just a minute. Sorry to interrupt, ma'am. We have one more panelist, ma'am. The yeah. last panel. Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Hetal Shukla is here. Yeah, he's yes, there. Yes, yes, I am there. No, uh, we yeah. can continue, please. Can, can you have the slides? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can continue. No problem. <coughs> Okay. Uh, I would uh, like shall to I stop sharing them? by the time you show? No, them? no, it's okay, ma'am. Let us go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I would like I'm to. I'm there. Don't Dr. worry. Uh, Wait, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. It, it's okay. It's okay. Dr. Hetal Shukla is from uh, Gujarat, Ahmedabad. He's an eminent embryologist and having a vast experience. So we welcome you on board, Dr. Hetal. And uh, we would like to uh, have your uh, precious comment on uh, what we are going to discuss today. That is the sperm acrosome and the importance of acrosome. What does it uh, play a major role in fertilization and subsequent uh, embryo development? I would like to invite all the panelists and uh, would like to welcome their thoughts and views on this uh, 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 special topic which uh, Vaitsar has uh, uh, described and uh, Vaitsar was very keen to it uh, to discuss a lot about sperm microsome only. So uh, uh, without wasting any uh, time, uh, you can start the session. Okay, so the topic is about the cap, the player that is the sperm. We all know for every player how important the cap or the helmet is to, in order to protect oneself. And it is said that the whole shadow of the man is as big as his cap. And so rightly said. And therefore, we have this webinar today on panel, uh, this panel discussion and the webinar on the player sperm with or without cap. So let us see how does the sperm behave with and without the cap in different situations and circumstances. <clears throat> so uh, both me and Dr. Rahul here will be um, trying to interact with all our learned panelists and get the maximum possible information today. Uh, I'm sure people uh, should be able to take home good messages today. So as Dr. Uh, has, has already been said in the previous lecture by Dr. Sanket, that the sperm cap or the acrosome is a cap-like structure derived from the Golgi apparatus. May I add the lysosomes also? And it develops over the anterior front half of the head of the spermatozoa and in not only in humans, but other mammals as well, other animals as well. <clears throat> and therefore, let us first know the basic, right from the beginning, what is acrosome all about? What is the structure and function of the acrosome? And I would like to invite Dr. Vijay Mangoli, sir, to please enlighten us about the various aspects of the acrosome and the cap, as we would like to call it today. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Bindu, and thank you, Rahul. Thank you, everyone, for this really, truly uh, unique topic, uh, which I, I never came across uh, such unique topic before for any panel discussion, I must say. Yes. Uh, generally, this was a part of the endology part of it, but this you have selected as a unique and complete topic as such. Congratulations to you, with. Well, uh, why is acrosomal cap important? So, well, before getting the answer uh, directly to this question, let's briefly understand uh, the structure of the sperm and its role in the fertilization. I, I will try to be as short as possible. Uh, well, there are, uh, yeah, uh, Bindu, uh, yeah, right. You can just go on forwarding these slides as, as I move ahead. Okay, uh, the previous one, the previous one. Right, yeah, the next one. Right, okay. Now, there are two stages that enable a sperm to become really competent for the fertilization. One is the capacitation and second is the acrosome reaction. To begin with, when the sperms are formed in the testes and when they are stored temporarily into the epididymis and they travel through the vast difference, one very important aspect takes place here. They get embedded with the cholesterol and the inhibitory factors, which causes the decapacitation of the sperm. 
Now, the purpose of this decapacitation are two folds. One is the hardening of the exosomal cap, which prevents the release of its enzymes during the transport. And second is the depletion of the calcium ions, which reduces the motility of the sperm. Now, you just see how nature has utilized, you know, the whole system very, very systematically, very, very meticulously to prevent, to conserve the energy as well as the resources. Just imagine if at this stage, if all the sperms, they are acrosomy active, what will happen? They will start releasing all the enzymes at this stage itself. In the epididymis, in the vast difference, is it required? It is not required. So there has to be a system that prevents the sperm from doing so. And this is that decapacitation. The second part is the motility. There is no need for the sperms to show that they are motile at this stage. They are live. They have the capacity to move, but it is restricted at this point of time because nature wants it that way. They will get capacitated, and we know that at some point of time, they need to get it capacitated. Let <laughs> nature wants them to do it at a proper time. Okay, so we know that this situation needs to be uh, reversed at some point of time. The acrosome reaction is followed by the capacitation. So the capacitation takes place first, and then followed by the uh, acrosome reaction. Now the acrosome cap, it is a specialized structure, as we all know. It is already discussed which is found in the uh, head of the sperms, membrane-bound organelle. It, it, this is important that it is a membrane-bound, it is not open, and it is situated at the tip of the uh, head, just above the nucleus. It is this physical field with proteolytic enzymes, mainly hydrolytase, acrosine, and trypsin-like substance, and they work under the influence of progesterone. Now, this is important because I will, I'm going to tell this where the progesterone will come from. Now, during capacitation, as we know, the uterine fluid, it induces an increase in the calcium ion intake. It causes the hyperactivation of the sperm. So, now I am coming out of the uh, vast difference. And after the sperms are ejaculated into the uterine, uh, into the vagina, this is what the actually beginning of the whole process of the chromosomes, uh, acrosome reactions. So, now comes the most, the, the, the significant part before the sperm goes and attaches to the zona is their hyperactivation, you know, they go through, they, they penetrate the uh, cumulus and coronary data, and now they are reaching the zona pellucida. Now comes the most important part of the cap. What is the basic significance of this cap as far as the zona is concerned? As the sperm touches the zona, just pay a little bit more attention. The zona has different kinds of proteins, ZP1, ZP2, ZP3, and each has its own significance. ZP3 is extremely important. Why it is important? Because unless and until this ZP3 recognizes the sperm that is approaching the zona, and it, it okays that, fine, now you can come and enter inside. Till then, the acrosome reaction is not you know, initiated. On what basis the ZP3 gives this permission? It is the species specificity. It is only after this ZP3 protein says that, yes, you are also from a human being, you can enter inside. Otherwise, even the bull sperm can go and uh, enter um, under the natural circumstances. So just imagine how nature has taken you know, the, the measures to, to, for the proper fertilization. So that, that was the uh, part. And then induces the acrosome reaction. Otherwise, uh, as I mentioned it to you, the bull sperm may enter. So these enzymes, they work to digest the glycoproteins, and then the actual acrosome reaction begins, making the entry of the sperm smooth and easy. So this is the first part of you know the whole how it, it begins and what is the what is the importance of the sperm cap. I hope that uh, you know I made it a little bit clear. Bindu, please unmute, unmute. Yeah, if you could uh, explain a bit more uh, about this function of acro acrosome again. Well, you want me to do that? Because I, I restricted this thing because I think Charulta is going to talk a little bit detail on this one and I, I wanted to avoid the repetition. That is why I restricted to till this stage. So after this, whatever re acrosome reaction, it's a big chain of events as you are showing it here. But uh, I, I think the Charu is going to explain it. Well. Is, isn't it Charu? You can we go can ahead. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, is it Mr. Charu or Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> there are two Charu here. No, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. So, uh, no, no. yeah. So, uh, sorry, Vijay ji, yeah. Uh, sorry anyway. for my voice because I am also suffering for bad cough and fever. Mm. So, uh, like what uh, Vijay ji has said that ZP3 is really, you know, good in case of the conventional IVF, like natural though we know that uh, it uh, takes uh, in a natural course where uh, from uterine cavity to it uh, in somewhere in ampulla in a fallopian tube it meet the sperm and uh, corona radiate and all that but in case of conventional ivf further to go one step ahead there are Charu, three, yeah first we this, have, the function of the acrosome how the acrosome reaction occurs then we'll yeah. move on to the differences so see, so basic the acrosome reaction when uh, uh, the first step is the capacitation so that, you know, with the cyclic AMP, the motility of the means the tail will have been motile and as well as uh, uh, the first part of the day, uh, the progesterone uh, will meet uh, the capacitation process starts then the um, uh, hyperactivation of the sperm takes place and then the second step is the acrosome reaction once it will go into the corona radiata mm -hmm. that will you know the acrosine and the hyaluronic enzyme both will place the role here so that hyaluronic enzyme will start digesting the you know uh, corona radiata and that gets entry into that after that once the acrosome reacted sperm enters into the ulemma and all that there will be a cortical granule mm -hmm. which will not allow another sperm to enter into the uh, oplasm, into the sperm. That's why it is, you know, blocking the polyspermy in case of the uh, conventional IVF. And then there is a fusion of the sperm uh, and the female, and then we'll have the pronuclear stage. So that is what, in short, in brief, as the acrosome reaction. Okay, so I'm sure the audiences have uh, really understood what the acrosome reaction is all about. It's about the fusion of the gamete membranes, the male and the female gamete <coughs> membranes, the ZP3 and the sperm um, acrosome membrane react to give the acrosome reaction. And the basic idea is to release the calcium ions. Uh, that is what acrosome reaction is all about. This uh, figure tries to show uh, just an animated uh, uh, image of what acrosome reaction is all about. Correct. And uh, as Dr. Vijay Mangoli and Charulata have said rightly that the capacitation followed by acrosome reaction is necessary for fertilization. So unless uh, these reactions occur, fertilization will not take place. So capacitated, non-capacitated at the right time, so that the acrosome reaction can occur at the right time and this can facilitate the fertilization process. Okay, so in short, CAP is important. The, when the, whether we say CAP for capacitation or the acrosome CAP, it is important. And uh, there are a few studies which have tried to find out what is the CAP score uh, to find out uh, the function, whether the sperm is functional or not. And it has been found that about 35% of the sperm that undergo, I mean, this is the minimal threshold value that is required for um, um, a fertile man. 35% of the sperm should undergo capacitation. So a CAP score threshold of 35% is required for uh, a fertile man. Any, anything less than that is abnormal and may lead to infertility. Okay, so moving on to the next Rahul. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so can you, uh, Bindu, like this CAP score, it is really very good uh, to identify the capacity to fertilize the sperm. Yes. And I, uh, by going through some literature, I feel that there is a company uh, in New Jersey that uh, Andronia Life Sciences, where it is based on, I think, uh, GM1 protein, uh, which fluorescence microscopy they are doing. But in India, is anyone doing? You have idea? Uh, like it is uh, no not really because uh, uh, just while going through literature i found this and i found it very interesting because yeah we have really not done yeah. it yes. i mean to be very honest yes yes so it is a very good uh, taste uh, to like you know, yeah. maybe shortly we can yeah rahul yes uh, uh, yes uh, very well uh, explained by vijay sir and uh, uh, charu ma'am also that uh, uh, the acrosome has its uh, own role play, acrosome uh, there on the sperm has its own importance, not only with the structure, with the function also, 
as the sperm is the only cell in the human in the uh, nature that it faces a series of changes from the male reproductive tract to the female reproductive tract and the function the major the, the major role in the function we can say is to uh, to recognize an egg and to fertilize it to produce subsequent embryo and for the conception so as we see a cascade of events which are seen there in the nature but what we do in, what we do in assisted reproduction that there are the sequences which are being skipped or which are bypassed in the natural in the art assisted reproduction so uh, i would like to ask uh, uh, charu ma'am uh, that uh, do you think that these uh, the bypassing of these events can have any significant effect on the uh, sperm acrosome or on the capacitation or uh, during the uh, process of fertilization also yes charu ma'am please ah uh, see uh, rahul as long as what uh, natural selection is you know it is the your uh, picture itself it is so self explanatory that i don't need to explain anything about it because it is so well i must say this picture is really lovely because it gives every idea about ki wa what happens in uh, iui where it is bypass whereas ivf and icsi and in case of the surgical plus sperm collection so what still ivf i don't think we are worried because uh, we are you know inseminating the oocyte with 50000 to 1 lakh sperm and uh, uh, the major um, methods what we feel density gradient and the sperm preparation media will take care of everything but in case of the icsi where uh, the selection of the Charu, sperm uh, yes can you please uh, just in general uh, how does what does sperm preparation do actually yeah so fine so in, any method like um, basically what widely used is a sperm uh, de double density gradient like so what happens we have a ingredient if you check the sperm preparation media first is the buffer either hepis or bicarbonate so it will help us to you know uh, maintain the internal ph uh, of the uh, sperm and anything other and, and next is albumin majority like we were i think having synthetic albumin or bovine serum albumin that will also help to you know kind of uh, activate the sperm and uh, uh, it will help into the first decapacitation and then the capacitation starts so that can you also help into the uh, fertilization later on so the sperm preparation media other the antioxidant antioxidants whatever we are adding that also helps to keep the uh, sperm dna mm -hmm. in the intact uh, uh, condition which is now in every commercial media which is also you know it will not uh, getting uh, fragmented in the sperm preparation media in spite of we are centrifuging it so this all media what the ingredient itself it's so you know well balanced that it helps into the sperm to uh, make the right you know kind of fertilization process in terms of icsi also so what the idea behind sperm preparation is that we need to remove the factors that inhibit acrosome reaction but at the same time we have to retain the molecules Excellent. that will help in the adhesion or the binding process because other if if there is anything wrong with the sperm preparation process then again it may, the sperm may <coughs> fail to fertilize the egg so uh, you had just mentioned about uh, ivf where a certain amount of uh, certain concentration of sperm is added is there any condition where in spite of adding the sperm in ivf also we all talk of uh, fertilization failure post icsi what about fertilization failure in ivf in conventional ivf uh, what could go wrong with the acrosome there i mean is there anything going wrong with capacitation and acrosome reaction there absolutely Which... so all acrosome reacted sperm will not you know enter into the oplasm and get the fusion mm -hmm. so if in ivf also so in icsi 1 to 3% chances for the fertilization failure whereas Uh, up to eight percent, we can see that there is a fertilization failure in spite of uh, you know inseminating the oocyte with fifty thousand to one lakh, whatever the concentration. But if it is you know capacitation and acrosome reaction happen earlier, and then it may not enter into it may not you know fuse into the uh, cumulus or a Z pin. That way, it is not going to get entry into the. Uh, 
ulemma. So that's why it is the fertilization is failure in spite of having the, you know, maybe the acrosome reaction has happened early or maybe it is not an all acrosome reacted sperm also cannot have that capacity to enter into that. So in spite of, you know, thousands of sperm, we might uh, have sometimes fertilization failure. Yeah, maybe that 35% threshold might explain that yeah, uh, absolutely. we may not really be putting, uh, we may be putting the concentration right, but then how many of them are really uh, able to fertilize the egg is important. Absolutely. So yes, we may not uh, necessarily blame the sperm function all the time. Maybe we have gone wrong somewhere with the concentration of the sperm. Maybe the pre sperm preparation method itself might uh, somewhere have uh, contributed to the fertilization failure process. So uh, next, I think we'll move on to specific um, techniques in sperm uh, preparation, which could hamper the uh, or affect the cap. So I think uh, Dr. Parag, uh, if he's there. And another like what we can say cap score, <clears throat> the another phenomena it's called cholesterol yes, phospholipid uh, ratio. If it is less than 0.83, that is also in uh, mainly in a, uh, unexplained infertility uh, that could be also reason for you know the man is infertile in spite of having a good sperm count correct 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 okay so dr parak are you there <coughs> yes okay dr parak so yes, let yes. me move on to the very specific points during the sperm preparation do you think that the timing of collection uh, of the sample the method of collection of sample uh, all this makes a difference. Where, when is it collected? When is it prepared? When is the sample prepared? What is the time interval between the preparation of sample and use of the sample? Does all that make any difference? What would you advise? Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bindu for uh, asking me this very important because I, uh, I would first like to thank to, you know, at least focus on this particular uh, part of ART, which is a male part, which is uh, generally ignorant, thanks to Dr. Ved and other people. Uh, first of all, I would like to give a statement like that the ART is a total game of bypassing the nature itself. So we are bypassing, uh, you know, uh, you know, somebody is in part I, so we are bypassing that particular thing and we are making uh, them part I, uh, you know, make, may, so there is a there is a there is a, uh, there is a premature capacitation also happens due to over smoking and all these things so this is also uh, important to understand before uh, you know going into this sperm separation what is the timing of course timing is important but there, there are some double edged shorts are there i would explain like in ICSI, uh, what happens in zona pellucida penetration and ulemal fusions are bypassed and the acrosomation may be seen as unnecessary. The introduction of ICSI actually in human um, uh, uh, and the achievement we'll of high fertilization on. rate was the... We'll have, we have okay. this question later also. Uh, yeah. just, just I was, yes, just I was introducing like, see, uh, the mainly, you know, post ovum pickup or pre ovum pickup, this ideal time of collection, it depends then uh, like, I mean my uh, you know what is my timeline what i follow what i recommend like the at the 35 hours post trigger we do a home pickup now the 36 hours for cement collection discard we do that is basically to you know helps in discarding the ros involvement uh, definitely important the collection because the collection after collection the preparation should not be very much you know uh, there should not be more time because uh, otherwise the you know uh, in the seminal plasma the sperm, there are ROAs and other factors are there. Uh, so that basically after 30 minutes, uh, you know, the time frame is like within 20 to 30 minutes. If the semen is liquefied, we need to, uh, you know, wash that particular semen and take out the good sperm either by a density gradient or a post swim up or something like that. Whatever the procedure you are following that somebody will explain after that. But uh, that is very important to collect that particular sperm from the seminal plasma very quickly. After that, why I was elaborating, I was actually going to that particular point, like time between preparation and use. There is a, a double-edged short. Why? Because after preparation, if you keep that sperm, there are some uh, articles which says, like if you keep that sperm very small, smaller time, 
the the acrosome reaction we because we are going to going to do the ICC. If we are going to do the ICC, then the acrosome reaction if it is already acrosome reacted and then we do the ICC, that will be giving the uh, a good fertilization rate and embryo uh, development. And uh, that actually uh, some paper says like three hours would be the best time after preparation. Uh, you know if but more than that the sperm decondensation condensation also happens. That's why you know, more than that time, because that uh, paper also shows like the five hours also, that is a very, uh, it, it's not good because the that fertilization rate goes down. Uh, so ideal time we follow is two to three hours after preparation, we pre-incubate the sample and then go for, uh, you know, keep it in 37 degrees centigrade so that the capacitation takes place. Not after, uh, after collecting the semen, Keep it in room temperature. After preparation, put it in the uh, bicarbonate media and uh, in the 37 degree centigrade and uh, let the capacitation happens if it is for ICSI or if it is not for ICSI, then IVF, then you, uh, you know, after keeping it, you have to, uh, you know, uh, incubate with the egg. That is the uh, most important part. Otherwise, the ADP plus PI, it will, ATP will go down and uh, um, you know it may be fertilization failure may happen and the certification time i i generally keep 300 g uh, and for density gradient i keep it in like uh, you know 15 minutes first uh, density gradients uh, in 300 g and then 8 minutes uh, in 300 g second wash that is the that is the procedure i follow if you have any other specific question then i can go ahead with that Ideally, yeah, I keep uh, it uh, in short, like within 40 to 41 hours for the, from the, uh, you know, trigger, I uh, generally start the ICSI. That is my uh, SOP. Okay. Uh, before we go into the centrifugation time and speed, I would like to ask, does anyone differ with Dr. Parag? Because he said after collection at room temperature and after preparation at 37 degrees centigrade. So is there anyone who differs or do you all follow the same procedure? What is the idea of doing, uh, preparing a sample, centrifuging it and keeping it at a specific temperature? I mean, what the purpose, what is the purpose behind all this? Yeah, acrosome reaction, I said. Correct. Yeah, so, uh, uh, I mean, someone, anyone who differs? So, uh, if I may, I mean, uh, if yeah, I may, but, uh, uh, previous, some of the previous questions which might have an overlapping answer as well. So yes, yes. Question yes, regarding yes. sperm preparation and capacitation and acrosome reaction. Correct. So the objective of sperm preparation, whether it is uh, swim up or density gradient, is to have capacitated sperms which are ready to induce acrosome reactions when Correct. they meet the uh, physical uh, physiological uh, stimulus. That is the zona pellucida or the progesterone of the cumulus cells at the right orchestrated time. Correct. So if the time uh, so I always, uh, the analogy is a British gentleman taking off his hat to greet a lady. There's no point of greeting lady if she's not there. So if you have a premature acrosome reaction or premature uh, capacitation, it's uh, going to be detrimental. So these sperms, uh, you have various scores, you have uh, acrosome reaction, uh, uh, ARIC score and this and that. That means that uh, we can have a physiological uh, estimate of uh, whether the uh, fertility potential of this particular cohort of sperm is good enough for conventional insemination or do we need to resort to ICSI? Second, uh, if uh, we do not stick to the timelines and the temperatures uh, in the sense that uh, with regards to this question, time between collection and preparation, we would want the collection to be at a point of time wherein we have minimal time from collection to liquefaction and processing and post-processing, post-second wash, when you if you are uh, uh, suspending your uh, final pellet into bicarbonate buffered media, you would allow an R for capacitation to occur or HEPIS buffered media, uh, which contains albumin. And so uh, you would do this at a point of time wherein post one hour of preparation, you are ready to inject or inseminate. So there have been studies which show that time uh, vary at various intervals, less than one hour, one to three hours, three to five hours, post five hours. There are differences, but the differences are uh, not significant uh, between one to three hours. So this is a con comfortable time. And this is synonymous with the time that we would want to denude and inject our oocytes in ICSI or uh, carry on conventional insemination. Temperature is also important. You want to approximate the temperature uh, uh, that is having in, uh, of what is occurring in, in, in vivo, but 
uh, the dictum is that uh, you would wait for the sample to arrive, uh, uh, rest for uh, 25 to 30 minutes uh, for liquefaction at 37 yes. degrees. And once you have uh, processed the sample, uh, you would not want to uh, rest the sample at 37 degrees because Correct. ROS uh, generation and sperm DNA damage uh, are occurring and they are increasing as with each passing hour. But that being said, uh, for uh, conventional insemination, I uh, don't know uh, how would you go about uh, resuspending in a bicarbonate buffered media and keep in an incubator which is maintained at room temperature and not uh, 37 degrees. So for, I think, a conventional insemination, you would still uh, put it in uh, the uh, bicarbonate buffered media at 37 degrees. But for uh, XC insemination, you can keep it at room temperature when uh, suspended in, uh, in HEPIS or MOS buffered media. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we move on. To Rahul? Dilip, yeah. Uh, next, uh, can we have uh, Dilip here? Uh, Dilip, are you there? I think Dilip is not there. Okay. So, okay, uh, I so think maybe... we, we, can, uh -huh. uh, we can open the questions, uh, uh, this uh, question for all. So, uh, as already explained by uh, Pranay and uh, Dr. Pa Parag very well that uh, uh, the uh, sperm collection uh, has its own importance. The time of collection after the ovum pickup, before the ovum pickup, when to do the collections, how to do, how to get the collected semen in the lab, where to keep it on the uh, room temperature or 37 degree temperature. It is very well explained and elaborated by both of the panelists. Now, as the sample is there in the lab and now it is getting ready for the preparation. So uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask and I would like to have your comments that uh, do you have any choices of method of preparation or there is like something like a single uh, uh, technique which will be used for all the uh, ejaculates to be prepared in the lab? So uh, yeah. Uh, us to go with uh, Dr. Pranay, yeah, you can uh, it, uh, actually, uh, irrespective of the topic of today, I think it depends on the initial uh, count motility and uh, morphology, even though morphology is not given that much importance. And uh, yeah. you cannot have a blanket uh, ideal sperm preparation method, even though it has been said that a double density or density gradient is the gold standard with regards to post wash yield and uh, morphology and DNA integrity. That being said, you have to be uh, prudent, and especially in case you are doing a uh, uh, the procedure for patients with documented high sperm DNA fragmentation, therein you perhaps would not em employ any of the conventional methods and go on to the newer sperm sorting methods. Uh, any of the sperm sorting methods would give you capacitated sperms and you can employ them for uh, density gradient uh, for uh, either XC or conventional insemination or IUI. The effect of media on sperm capacitation is uh, that, uh, so capacitation we have to understand again if you have to break down capacitation, it starts right from the moment where the sperms are ejaculated from, uh, so the transit from epididymis, right from the transit from the epididymis, as they go into the spinal plasma, capacitation is uh, initiated. initiated. So it is suspended into deep capacitating factors. And what is happening is you are moving from a acidic pH to an alkaline pH. And uh, what is happening is the intracellular uh, concentrations of sodium, bicarbonate, and potassium, they are getting altered. Initially, it is high potassium, then it is getting altered by high bicarbonate. So you have to mimic that. Uh, the point is, at the end of sperm preparation, you have to have a capacitated sample. That means that sperm has acquired hyper, uh, uh, this, uh, hyperactivated motility, which is different from the progressive linear motility. The sperms are swimming in circles. They are, uh, uh, they are uh, having hypermotile, and they are ready to attach to the zona. Uh, it has been shown that none of the sperm preparation techniques, they cause premature acrosome reaction. Acrosome reaction will still be induced at the time of the sperm zona binding or at the time of tail cutting in XC. It is a wrong belief that in XC we are injecting sperm with uh, intact... We'll come to that, uh, Pranay. Sorry. That's, That's again for you. That question is for you later. And the last question is... Uh, uh, Cryopreserved sperm. So yes, uh, the uh, cryopreserved samples, when thought, they undergo premature capacitation. There has been a term reserved for them, which is called as cryocapacitation. So you'll see that, uh, uh, again, if I have to elaborate on cryopreserved semen sample, there is there are different schools of thought. 
one school of thought says that cryo preservation it does not alter post thaw motility viability for normozoospermic samples and only patients with oligo eosino teratozoospermic samples have a uh, degradation in these parameters and sperm dna the other school of thought it says that uh, irrespective of the semen sample whether it is normozoospermic or oligozoospermic or pa ca cancer patients post thawing you will have differences in motility viability uh, and uh, you will have premature capacitation and perhaps premature acrosome reaction so uh, you uh, how we can pre uh, prevent that is uh, perhaps uh, out of the scope of this but yes uh, we have to also factor in that when we are measuring post thought spermatozoa and looking at them for their premature acrosome reaction we have to discount the dead sperms because there is no point looking at dead sperms and doing acrosome reaction uh, studies on this so what we have to do is uh, you will see any of these studies in which we are looking at acrosome reaction uh, by fluorescence what we are doing is uh, we are having a uh, acrosome reaction fluorescence and we are having supravital staining as well to make sure that the sperm on which we are performing acrosome reaction studies is a vital sperm or not because dead sp sperms will be devoid of acrosome or have deformed acrosome so yes crow preserve semen sem sample in my opinion will have a cryo capacitation and a premature acrosome reaction to a higher extent and so would you advise only icsi or you can still go ahead with conventional insemination or maybe even iui with a cryo preserved sperm no oh, uh, i think in literature it says that you can uh, go ahead with every uh, any of the mentioned uh, modalities but in our experience we have been very wary of uh, cryo preserved uh, frozen thawed semen sample and we employ only for icsi if you have to take a call on the day of uh, pickup for patients who are employing it for uh, iui uh, we have uh, seen that it uh, the results are uh, different from what uh, you would achieve with uh, fresh samples even though that's how you would be doing your donor insemination donor insemination yeah. uh, i would like yeah. to add okay. here I, yes. as the theoretically i agree with all the pranav but uh, my practical experience differs here like cryo preserve samples i have been be doing from past 20 years and i am checking the fertilization rate uh, with icsi and the conventional ivf <coughs> also and even conventional ivf with fresh and frozen i don't i, I didn't find any difference uh, much so i don't know how to explain this so that is about yeah. how you treat your cryo preserved sample how it has been frozen then after that have you centrifuged yeah. remove the cryo protectant and then again resuspended in fresh medium so how you go about all this and at what so temperature so basically I, i i i i uh, no rather than process sperm i freeze the raw semen okay so, so i believe that uh, sperm, antioxidant whichever present in the seminal you know plasma protects the sperm well rather than you know uh, Uh, freezing the process sperm so my always the sperm preparation is uh, for me it is after the thawing yes so i think uh, myself uh, uh, do you think i think yeah. dr vijay yeah. is saying something sorry uh yeah i was i think initially i think dr parag was trying to say something parag if you are saying something go ahead then i will give my comment no 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 i i i do i do follow that same procedure that the frozen sample and i have a particular school of thought i uh, feel always like in 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 uh, human gametes uh, other things like we are freezing like in sperm if we freeze and we thaw that is my personal experience is like those sperms which survives the cryo uh, injury those are the best sperm i i find it during xc that is my i agree with you uh, parag and the tool is speaking the freezing protocol and the outcome and the modality entirely depends upon the initial count and initial quality of the sperm you know this is how we are treating the donor sperm where we have more than 70 80 million count and therefore after freezing and thawing with the conventional methods even if around 50% of the sperms are dead or 50% of the sperm become non usable still we have sufficient <coughs> for even the iui purposes and definitely for ivf and certainly for the icsi now as far as the time duration is concerned see many times it has happened that we have used a sample which is processed maybe half day early or the previous day and we have used that the next day at the time of uh, you know uh, om pickup and with excellent results both 
in terms of the fertilization and cleavage and in terms of getting the uh, blastocyst as well so we as far as possible we have to mimic and in in uh, vivo as we know the sperm can retain viable their viability till up to 72 hours definitely 48 48 hours is golden time but even up to 72 hours they can remain motile not only motile but viable and they have the potential to fertilize the egg so the same thing we, there is no reason for us to believe that just because we are treating them in vitro they will lose their potential so it, it is it is entirely up to the uh, initial quality that will decide the mode of the uh, preparation but definitely we will not keep it at 37 degrees centigrade because in that case they will become hyperactive and capacitated and then they then go down in their motility. So we will not be able to use it if we keep it for a prolonged time at 37 degrees centigrade. That also depends, uh, Bindu, because it, it, it depends upon the, the that sample quality because not necessarily that the hyperactivity pattern should go down after the you know 16 to 18 hours or whatever time we have kept it. For example, previous day, if you have processed the sample by around 3 or 4 o'clock, and next day, if you're going to use it, say, by at around 11 o'clock, many times they retain a very good motility. Yes. And many times, you know, it is seen that they have become just twitching motility. It entirely depends upon the sperm quality. There is no hard and fast or the thumb rule, which says that, if you process the sample, say around three hours or four hours before that, then only you will be getting a well capacitated sperm. Capacitation definitely, will, what is the capacitation? As I mentioned in my slide, the opposite of the decapacitation, which nature has done it to prevent the normal acrosome reaction as well as the hyperactivation. Mm -hmm. This is because of the inhibitory factors which has coated during their passage through the vas and the um, epididymis. As soon as the spores are ejaculated out and they come into the smell plasma and enter into the uterine cavity or into the culture medium, they try swimming up. And then while swimming up, they lose all that inhibitory factors which are attached to them. So the capacitation becomes just at that point. Okay, yeah, that's why even in conventional IVF, the next day when we see the dish, the um, uh, uh, the sperm are still active and motile. So yes. Okay, so can we move uh, any more sorry. inputs yeah, coming uh, here? Yeah, Sanket, yeah, please, you can. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, yeah, uh, just to extend the point, madam. Uh, the point is uh, I've come across the literature where they says that the capacitation doesn't last for a few hours or something. Say uh, one of the paper, I don't remember the paper, but they have proven scientific like uh, with experiments that it lasts from four hours to 24 hours. Maybe probably that that's the reason why, uh, as you said, I just said that the next day of conventional insemination also we get to see the sperms which are hyperactive and moving forward progressive. Maybe uh, it is an individualized thing, uh, not only like a, a like gross thing or like blanket rule where we can apply. This is the time where it, where it starts and this is the time where it ends. And uh, as you've already discussed about the reverse uh, capacitation process also, the moment you uh, withdraw the media, which is supporting the capacitation, you might reverse the process as such. Okay. Yeah, so uh, can we move on to the next one, please? I will skip this. Okay, so uh, sperm preparation actually removes the decapacitation factors and uh, we get a good capacitated sperm. So now we move on to the next question. Uh, Dr. Hetal, are you there? Dr. Hetal, unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah uh, Rahul, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, as we are uh, already discussing a lot about, about the acrosome, its function, role, and how it uh, uh, reacts and how it functions in vitro. So uh, now moving, uh, taking the acrosome with the uh, morphology of the sperm. So uh, Dr. Hetal Shukla, I would like your comments and opinions, how it can, how the morphology of sperm and acrosome, it can differ together. Do you think morphology has any role in it or a morphology can uh, uh, affect the uh, role and function of the acrosome? Uh, see, uh... Normal, normal, normal spermatozoa have definitely, and this has got the uh, correlation, means established correlation with uh, transmission electron microscopy that has shown 
normal dense nucleus normal acrosome uh, covering the all uh, what we can anterior uh, two thirds of the head and everything with the normal spermatozoa with uh, at least uh, 12000 magnification so hence yes it it it, it uh, normal sperm normal looking sperm means oval shape and uh, around 5 uh, 5 micrometer of the head length uh, around 3 micrometer of uh, width that that kind of uh, sperm if you find in your uh, pool of the spermatozoa probably it has it is going very likely that it will have a very normal acrosome so but again if we slightly more understand about the possible uh, abnormalities of the uh, acrosomal uh, with acrosome and that too again confirmed by the uh, electron microscopy so maybe it it has uh, it is sometimes found with uh, redundancy or the detachment of the acrosome acrosomal swelling is also found knobbing and all which we routinely can see uh, in uh, uh, our uh, phase contrast microscopy also knobbing ruffling or uh, even uh, lost acrosome yeah, and and above all, many very rare, but most important uh, phenomena, which could be a globojuspermia, uh, and probably this needs to be looked at very uh, precisely with motility. Uh, uh, no new people can skip uh, recognizing globojuspermia. Uh, which is not very difficult also, but we, it is very rare. That is why probably many people skip it uh, uh, also. So yes, globosuspermia, that shows an absence of uh, acrosome, uh, acrosome swelling with vacuoles. Yes, it uh, plays a very uh, important role with the... So, and it is also uh, established that acrosomal size, morphological appearance, uh, that all reflects uh, physiological capability of sperm function, and therefore it is uh, 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 connected with the male fertility potential. Um, yeah. That's what I feel. Are there any so, staining techniques which will help us identify? See, uh, in uh, in our industry, I mean, in uh, our, our laboratories, acrosome is not uh, uh, routinely in focus with staining. Uh, but I would like to share my experience in veterinary science. And there, we were routinely staining with Jimsa stain. And it was working excellent. Uh, 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 to identify the uh, acrosome, uh, four kinds of uh, uh, acrosomal abnormalities we were looking at is, was knobbing of acrosome, ruffling on the acrosomal region, uh, uh, lost acrosome, and many a times, you know, decapitated cap was visible uh, in this light when we stain. So, without acrosome and the cap lying nearby could also be seen. So Jimsa works very well with uh, this one. Did you dilute the stain before using? Or the Jimsa stain just as you got no, it? No, no, we were, we were using it as a stock solution and using it at a, when we wanted means to add fresh, freshly prepared sperm. Okay, so I have uh, I have also done Jimsa staining with um, uh, human sperm, and we we needed to dilute because then otherwise it would be too dense and difficult to differentiate. But yeah. in case with Jimsa stain diluted, uh, yeah, we got yeah. good um, results where we could really make out the uh, yeah. acrosome. Yeah. Honestly speaking, I have no uh, experience with human sperm and Jimsa. You but should. Yes, you have I... done so much in veterinary. <laughs> Uh, yeah, science. yeah, yeah. I have, I have really done it. Okay, so now, uh, sorry, Pranay, Bindu, coming sorry, to your Dr. question, Doctor Bindu, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, you are telling that Jimsa stain. Oh, 
do we need that for jimson station uh, specific uh, optical uh, for that or maybe simple no, no. microscope will no, do no oil optical. under oil immersion lens yeah okay, okay. Yeah, oil immersion is fine oil okay. immersion lens we okay. used to see and okay. uh, air drying the same that we otherwise yeah, use for like staining, yeah, uh, staining yeah. air drying and then uh, under oil immersion lens okay okay perfect thank you okay so moving on to the next uh Pranay, your favorite question. Does ICSI totally obviate the need of a cap? So first, differentiate between the fertilization in, I mean, a normal fertilization process and what actually happens in ICSI. Is Pranay there? Uh, un unmute, unmute yourself. Uh, unmute first. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we heard about how the uh, uh, capacitated spermatozoa, they approach the OCC, the oocyte cumulus complex and the uh, physiological stimuli for the acrosome reaction being the zona pellucida and the cumulus uh, secreted progesterone. So what is happening is uh, your outer acrosomal membrane is fusing with the inner of the plasma membrane and you are having exocytosis of the uh, acrosomal contents and the acrosomal contents are these hy hydrolytic enzymes which are the acrosin and hyaluronidase. I think somebody else is yeah, and uh, you have the phospholipase yeah, yeah. from the perinuclear mm -hmm. theca. Uh, apart from that, uh, the other uh, so this facilitates uh, the formation of a pore and the sperm entry. Uh, uh, actually, not the sperm entry, the entry of the nuclear material. And once that and the phospholipase zeta they kick into action. You are having the release of uh, calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum and this calcium from the ER, which is uh, by the degradation of the inositol triphosphate. Right. It is the uh, uh, stimulus for cortical reaction so that no further sperm come in and cause polyspermy. Uh, the difference between the conventional insemination and the ICSI processes. In ICSI, what you're doing is you're uh, put, uh, immobilizing the sperm and you're injecting the sperm and you're uh, bypassing the OCC, the cumulus cells, the zona, and you're directly putting the sperm inside the uh, ooplasm. You presume in ICSI that uh, since the head is intact and you are uh, uh, crushing the tail, that the intact acrosome is being uh, injected inside the oocyte in ICSI, but that it is not so. Uh, it has been shown by various uh, membrane fluidity studies that the uh, compart this, uh, sperm is a single compartment and the crushing of the tail, the, uh, which damages the plasma lemma, also causes uh, the disruption in the acrosome and it induces acrosome reaction. So various transmission electron microscopy studies, uh, they have looked at uh, the uh, acrosome post aggressive uh, sperm immobilization in ICSI and they found that the acrosome is disrupted or absent. So uh, in uh, what you're doing is uh, you're injecting uh, uh, the uh, nuclear material and the phospholipase C in ICSI. So what is happen different in uh, conventional insemination and ICSI is the physiological, uh, uh, the way that the calcium os oscillations are occurring. They are more physiological and more, uh, they're faster in uh, conventional insemination as compared to ICSI, wherein uh, you'll have a gap between the uh, oocyte being, uh, the sperm being injected in the oocyte and the uh, appearance of the spikes. Uh, so that's how your ICSI and uh, conventional inseminations, they differ with regards to yeah so you said something about uh, uh, immobilizing the sperm uh, you said it causes damage to the acrosome so it is a harmful thing you mean to say it doesn't so not harmful in the sense that you're not crushing the acrosome but you're facilitating what uh, otherwise acrosome reaction what sperm's uh, zona binding would have elicited uh -huh, so it is actually good. So what yes. you are doing when you uh, immobilize the sperm is the, uh, I mean, there is this release of calcium ions. Right. It can occur only when you have immobilized the uh, tail. tail. So that yes. triggers a reaction and release of calcium ions. So uh, that is how the cap or the acrosome plays. See here in the, this is a beautiful one where it shows that the cap has been removed. So there is acrosome deletion. But at the same time, because you have 
immobilize the tail here it leads to it helps in the spindle formation and all so this is uh, the perinuclear theca or something i i i'm forgetting so this ha huh, this uh, reaction occurs and there is a release of calcium ions so if you do not immobilize this tail properly then it may uh, not lead to the release of calcium ions which is so required for the oocyte activation process yeah so okay so uh, yes uh, if you want you can also comment this the was this study wonderful which, study yeah. yeah they injected different sperm components like the head the tail and the head and tail severed and they found that the head was able to fertilize the oocyte uh, in a majority proportion of the cases and you had a sporadic uh, fertilization achieved in with the injection of the tail itself as well so uh, the conclusion of the study i think it has been taken from uh, one of the uh, seminal papers yeah, I, I made a mistake i should have taken the uh, it is uh, under understanding fertilization through ICSI. i think it is a paper yes, yes, from the yes. palermo and the queeny uh, neri uh, group itself so they showed that you can elicit a, elicit a fertilization with the uh, injection of the head components itself. But then uh, since you are not having the mid piece, uh, you will have acentriolar division and you'll have a lot more uh, segregation defect, uh, errors. Okay, so uh, Dr. Dilip is not here, uh, but I think uh, anyone who wants to take up how uh, Pranay has already spoken about the oocyte activation. So what is happening is you are uh, in, is the uh, entry of phospholipase C zeta, which is the uh, 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 marker uh, which was uh, which we previously labeled as oscillin or which was previously unknown, which is actually the uh, molecule that elicits the uh, uh, entire uh, uh, series of events post injection or post uh, 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 sperm zona binding is. The phospholipase C zeta, it's an enzyme, it's going to uh, uh, cause cleavage. It is going to cause a cleavage of inositol triphosphate into diacylglycerol and inositol biphosphate. These are going to act on the endoplasmic reticulum and cause a release of calcium. This calcium is released in the form of uh, spikes and oscillations. And these oscillations, they differ between the natural, uh, naturally the uh, uh, conventional insemination groups and ICSI groups in the sense that the ICSI groups are the uh, uh, like I mentioned, the oscillations are uh, delayed and they are more transient. So, uh, anyways, this uh, calcium uh, it drives the further events, like it will cause second uh, the polar body extrusion and uh, further events like uh, pronuclear formation and migration. So, it is very important. And this is what is happening is uh, what when even despite ICSI, we are not able to like in cases of global zoospermia where you have no acrosome, you are conducting ICSI without oocyte activation and you don't have phospholipase uh, zeta so you'll have complete uh, total failure of fertilization okay so uh, rahul we address this next question now uh, dr vijay sir yes yes so the question so how do you think that um, uh, acrosome is affecting the oocyte activation process Right. So, as we all know, that oocyte activation is absolutely necessary to carry out all the further actions after the sperm enters into the oplasm. Now, theoretically speaking, the capacitation, acrosome reaction, and the oocyte activation these are three different aspects of the whole uh, fertilization process. But we should make we should keep in mind that they are interdependent and they overlap each other. For example. The first one when it ends, the tail ends at that particular point only the next um, reaction starts. So the acrosome, acrosome the reaction begins towards the end part of the capacitation under the influence of uh, progesterone secreted by the uh, cumulus and corona radiator. When the hyperactive sperms, they come in contact with corona. Now, the oocyte activation begins when the acrosome reaction is about to end, which ends at the fusion of the membranes. Membrane. So the activated oocyte, now when it gets activated, there, there are two basic jobs. The first one is to block the entry of another sperm, which is absolutely necessary, as we all know, because otherwise too many sperms will enter. Now this occurs at two stages. One is called the fast block, the first immediate reaction. That is the fast block and second one is the slow block. In the first stage, the zona glycoprotein becomes non-permeable and therefore the sperms which are already attached to the zona because we know that too many sperm, they try to come and attach to the zona at the same time and only one will initiate 
the uh, reaction and it enters inside. But by that time, few more sperms must have attached into the zona, within the zona. So to block the entry of those sperms, which have entered even halfway through into the olema, this first block, it takes place. And the second block takes place in the, in, in the, in the, in the, by the means of the uh, you know calcium ion induced cortical value reaction, where the whole um, uh, entry of any other sperm coming near to the zona is blocked. And the second very important um, aspect of the oocyte activation is to resume the meiosis second and to expel the second polar body. And basically, it converts the chromosomal status as one small n, big small n. That means one chromosome, one chromatid. The chromatid which has replicated and becomes a two chromatid status, it expels itself in the form of the second polar body. And then a truly haploid status is achieved uh, so that the sperm will come and do it. So the acrosome reactions end part of it initiates the, um, you know, the oocyte activation part of it. And it is absolutely necessary. As I told you, it overlaps and it, they are all interrelated. Okay. And uh, what about fertilization failure post ICSI? I mean, uh, does it, is it because of oocyte activation deficiency? I think uh, um, anyone who wants to add, uh, Dr. Vijay sir, Charulata. Well, this part of it, fertilization failure post ICSI, it, it is, they can be either due to sperm factor or because of the uh, oocyte, oocyte factor. factor. Oocyte factor. So both factors we have to consider. Total fertilization failure, TFF, what is called as, you know, when all the oocytes collected within that particular um, stimulation cycle, they fail to form the pronuclear. That is called as total fertilization failure. We are not talking here about the partial you know, failures. Now, this is with oocyte activation deficiency as the primary cause of such uh, failures. And it has been demonstrated that yes. phospholipase C, zeta, protein, which is absence in the sperm head, as mentioned by Pranay direct failure of the signal in the calcium oscillation. And then while well, ICSI has a high rate of success, but still there are cases where OID involves ICSI failure. So even if after doing the ICSI, you know, there can be failures, which may be now because of the uh, sperm factor. Now we can slightly rectify this kind of defect, I can say, using the calcium ionophores, which are called as um, artificial um, you know, activators, AOI, this artificial oocyte um, activators. Um, just next slide, please. The modifications of such technologies, there are nowadays, which are, there are papers which says that after intracytoplasmic spur injection, which is followed by micro injections of the mRNA PLC zeta and recombinant active PLC zeta protein. This is under the new research team that is, that is um, going on. But they say that where there is total fertilization failure, this may, you know, in, this may induce the calcium oscillations and um, the fertilization may take place. Another genetic pathology is obviously the globospermia, which, which comes because of the genetic factors, which are <coughs> autosomal uh, recessive pathology, which is the partially or the total. It can be partial or it can be total. There can be few sperms which are um, globospermic or, or there can be few um, total globospermia, which is caused because of the mutation of uh, DPY19L2, uh, which the gene which is involved in, in the developing of the acrosome in the sperm and also the elongation uh, part of the uh, sperm head. Now, there are many uh, global spermia that are associated with the lack of the uh, PLC zeta. This PLC zeta is really very important. I think uh, Sanket was asking this question on the, in the, the chat box that to elaborate this point of it. It is extremely important and it really triggers the calcium oscillations. And the less common causes of the TFR are the sperm head. Another causes can be um, the sperm head decondensation, premature sperm chromatin decondensation, oocyte uh, spindle uh, defects. That also can be uh, problems because of the you know centriole uh, problems. Then the, there can be sperm defects that they they are unable to uh, initiate the um, activation part of it. And also the type of the failed fertilization of the oocyte activation after an ICSI cycle is associated with very low ability of the sperm to stimulate the calcium ion. Well, also sir, I might like to add, I mean, uh, very uh, elaborate uh, discussion on this, but then uh, PLC zeta null sperm have been shown to 
give fertilization as well as a live baby and that is uh, how the concept of oocyte factor in oocyte activation and it is not just plc zeta plc zeta apparently is one of the sperm factors which uh, is involved in the oocyte activation process but there are now other um, um, uh, fa sperm factors also which have been recognized and more importantly even in if in plc zeta null sperm have been able to give uh, fertilization that means now the target has moved from not just sperm factors but also the oocyte factors in the oocyte activation process so i mean we are still so a long way uh, in this regard bindu i also would like to say that some cases i have done the mechanical stimulation you know where right. i feel that so that is called a modified ICSI. So yes. there is a nice paper of uh, um, Abner that uh, you go till, you know, nine o'clock uh, till and then aspirate oocyte uh, cytoplasm twice and then release the sperm. So that also helps sometimes to activate the oocyte, which will, you know, cassia minophore is one of the thing, but this also some helps. Yes, of course, we'll be discussing about yeah. the various artificial oocyte activation uh, methods. And one of them, of course, is this mecha mechanical, mechanical activation. But what I am trying to say is, eventually, what you are talking about is the PLC zeta, which Absolutely. is uh, bringing about oocyte activation. But there are uh, studies in 2021, 20, um, uh, wonderful papers. We have also done a particular, uh, uh, published already a paper related to the oocyte factor in the oocyte activation process. So yes, PLC zeta is not the only factor and we are still a far, far uh, way uh, I mean, behind in understanding how it all goes about. I mean, how in uh, IVF, how in the natural cycles, how in ICSI, and how oocyte activation occurs. Uh, let us see uh, how have research a, takes us a, and a, our understanding takes us towards this these processes. Sorry, may okay. I come in, ma'am? Uh, yeah, please, please. Ma'am, uh, please, uh, please go to previous slide. Uh, because we just have been mentioning uh, one of the important study here, very interesting one, where uh, in the first uh, uh, para, uh, they say is that micro injections of uh, mRNA of PLC zeta. Yes. So uh, are they injecting the micro RNAs directly of PLC zeta or micro RNAs along with PLC zeta? Uh, well, uh, this is still under the um, experimental stage, uh, Sankit. So I don't have really, you know, in detail idea about exactly uh, how they are doing. Mm. Uh, I, I really have to see. Um, yes, sir, uh, my, my uh, point is, if you inject microRNA of PLC zeta, ah. this has to be translated into the PLC zeta. Ah. Then it has to go and undergo the scaffolding of the protein. Then it has to act. Correct. That and is like lengthy process. Absolutely, absolutely. That is that is very true. That is true. Yes, and one more thing which I was not aware was uh, uh, PLC zeta null. My uh, null sperm will also able to fertilize. Yeah, I'll send you that paper. Yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 if you I'll, like. Send, yeah. I think you know the dogma of. Uh, Central dogma. Central dogma. In a change, not central dogma. <laughs> <laughs> DNA, RNA. Protein. So is it that just that fit in our minds like that. <laughs> for the shortest time, we believe that now we have homed upon the thing that causes uh, fertilization, TLC zeta. But uh, of late, uh, now uh, the studies are coming in which say that uh, mammalian sperm, they contain two factors Correct. for calcium release. And one of them is uh, phospholipase C zeta. And the second is called Something WWW something. It's called cryptic activating factor because it is yet not formed. So it is yeah. called CAF, sperm cryptic activating factor. I think the uh, study uh, searches is still on what exactly it is. Perhaps we are on the same way as we be uh, begin to home, home in upon uh, this oscillin and uh, it was finally found to be uh, PLC zeta. So this is what you talk about SCAF, right? SCAF. SCAF. Sperm. No, there are others also. There is something sigma, something WWW. I'll, I'll, I'll just share that paper and uh, our study as well. So yes, it is very interesting to really uh, understand all these processes and how it occurs. So let's move on. But uh, at the moment in our panel, in my so opinion, anyone are... who would like to take uh, this question on what, could fertilization failure post ICSI be because you have probably not done your sperm preparation technique properly. Anyone? Dr. Hetal probably. Charu? Can Dr. you hear Parag, me? Yeah. Dr. Parag, Parag, Dr. Parag, are you there? Yeah. Dr. Parag, maybe you can take up this question. 
Doctor Parag got disconnected. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Doctor Piran. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As far as yeah, yes. as far as sperm preparation technique is concerned, uh, semen collection time, uh, then uh, uh, selection of the preparation technique, time taken for the preparation, and probably applied centrifugation. I mean, uh what g force you are applying for how much time that that uh, that and the temperature maintained throughout the preparation that these are all basic factors if these are done meticulously as per the standard operating procedures of the particular lab probably preparation has the minimal impact on the uh, acrosomal role on the fertilization and that's what i feel uh, with the preparation and all okay anyone wants to add or shall we move on uh, i think i want to say something i think we should have sanket on the yeah. panel as well yeah sanket you can join yeah yeah ma'am uh, see for me if you uh, look at it the fertilization failure post xc could be of uh, mainly two or three reasons i can name two or three no. First and foremost is like we are fine tuned with the sperm preparation techniques as of considered DGC has become a gold standard and a lot of microfluidic techniques are there, HPA binding assays are there, a lot of techniques are which are fine tuned. So <clears throat> having ruled out that, excuse me, if there is a fertilization for post XC, it could be a sperm factor, which is underlying factor, or it could be a underlying OSET factor. Yeah, I mean, that be, is yeah. another, I mean, we That's have already, already discussed that. Discussed okay. it, yeah. yeah. Or it could be a improper XC. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So if you have nothing more to add in this, can we yeah, move Dr. on? Prane, Dr. Pranay yeah, wants to add. Some yeah, Pranay, please. Uh, in my experience, whatever TFF we have encountered post XC are all unexpected. You do your things according to your SOPs. You're working on acrosome, uh, non uh, globosomic sperm. You are not uh, prepared mentally and you have a good cohort of oocytes. It's not like two, three oocytes and you label that as TFF. You have a good cohort of oocytes. So whatever TFFs we have encountered, they have all been uh, unforeseeable. You cannot predict and it's nothing that you did. And the proof of uh, concept is look at your uh, batch IVFs. The 10th case for which the semen was prepared hours ago and you are doing XC 6-8 hours ago uh, after uh, whatever the stipulated time and you are having uh, you are achieving fertilization so perhaps like uh, my previous uh, panelist mentioned that if you are adhering to sops uh, sperm preparation technique itself when you are respecting the timelines and the other sops with regards to temperature incubation time this and that uh, these will have minimal perturbations with regards to fertilization yeah uh, just to just to elaborate to this discussion yeah 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 dr Parag. Please, you yeah. can add this. Yeah, uh, another, uh, as Dr. Pranay said, uh, another uh, thing uh, I have uh, seen, like the, the infection sometimes, it, uh, you know, it also hinders sometimes the, you know, the whole site, all fertilization failure, that also happens. And, you know, the temperature, sudden temperature rise on the exit, uh, you know, plate, uh, that also, it is, it is, uh, it may happen like that. Uh, because I have seen some cases like this. Uh, but very, very few. And another thing I would like to add, like the meat piece uh, during the faulty technique of XC, uh, like during the uh, sperm, sperm scratching on the, if somebody is, uh, you know, uh, scratching on the neck, so that uh, leads to fertilization failure. So uh, if it is a sudden, then maybe other point, but if it is uh, something like the whole total fertilization failure, uh, you know, newcomer or new beginner or something like that, they have to be careful about that. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, can we talk about artificial activation? Uh, what uh, are your experiences with artificial activation, oocyte activation? So, uh, we have employed us, uh, like previously, Sir has mentioned that you can use PLC zeta microinjection and mRNA PLC zeta, or Dr. Charu has, uh, ma'am has mentioned that uh, you can use a modified XC wherein you go in at, uh, you do a, a mechanical. Uh, 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 manipulation in the sense that you 
presume that the um, mitochondria would be localized more at the periphery than at the center, and then you would aspirate a couple of times from the nine o'clock position to uh, a little uh, towards the uh, center of the O site. But then uh, uh, I think now what is most uh, clinically uh, accepted modality for artificial uh, artificial O site activation is the calcium ion core treatment. Uh, uh, these are uh, readily available. Uh, uh, in the uh, market and uh, you can uh, employ them uh, either uh, as a single exposure or in case of previous fertilization failure with AOA, you can uh, go on to uh, use them in serial uh, uh, and with the double, uh, double the exposure time. So we have uh, worked with them with a moderate success. We have published as well. Previously, we uh, have some uh, case series wherein we have uh, uh, live births in global zoospermia for uh, seven patients now. And uh, but uh, it should come with a pinch of salt that uh, AOA is not uh, calcium ionophore is not uh, a magical thing that will perhaps uh, work for all cases of uh, presumed uh, uh, TFF, wherein uh, there might be other factors as well, uh, and wherein comes the point of other looking for other putative candidates for the cryptic uh, activating factor SCAF. So even with the application of uh, calcium manophore, we have failed uh, on more than a couple of occasions uh, very uh, recently. And now we are a little, we treat a little cautiously and counsel the patient that uh, despite the use of double AOA as well, with double exposure, you might not uh, achieve fertilization in case of previously documented TFF with XC. Okay. So uh, Rahul, towards, I think we are towards the end, Rahul. So for this uh, uh, next uh, question, uh, uh, discussion, we can uh, have uh, Dr. Parag here. Uh, Dr. Charu is here. Yeah. Dr. Charu? So yeah, we can have uh, uh, Dr. Parag here. So uh, Dr. Parag, uh, uh, how uh, basically uh, uh, you document uh, this uh, the process of uh, the means the PN check is there and on the day of PN check there is something like a series of uh, uh, zygotes uh, which are visible like this. So uh, what is your condition means uh, on the day of PN check do you think now uh, getting uh, uh, a day before again and uh, correlating this PN abnormalities with the sperm promethine and acrosome. So do you think there is a correlation with this? Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, there is a there must be a correlation on that particular. Uh, but I have specifically, I would like to comment on this particular three pn, four pn, or something. Uh, I have encountered this kind of thing, and I I kept uh, those uh, in separate uh, you know uh, media droplet, and I have seen from that that, that uh, there was a, you know only you know very good uh, uh, blastocyst formation, and uh, you know. Uh, you know, I, I have not transferred that, but very good blastocyst formation. That was that was my uh, I have seen because I feel like that the three pn, four pn like this uh, this might happen sometime. There is a correlation with the sperm factor. It sometimes it slip ins like silent fertilization when sperm are incorporated into the ovum that you know, but do, do not expand to the male pronucleus, and it doesn't actually affect uh, to the you know. Uh, formation of good blastocyst and maybe after the, the there are documented papers I have seen many times they have got pregnancies out of it. So uh, may, may not be a very big uh, issue all the time. So uh, suppose, suppose, yeah. Dr. Yeah, please Char go ahead. Dr. Yeah. Charu, yeah. So, uh, uh, so on the uh, day of PN, like there is a situation or a scenario like 3 pn embryo uh, 3 pn zygotes are there so do you think going back to a day before and checking what was the post uh, uh, sperm preparation motility what was uh, means correlating with the hyperactive motility which was seen post preparation and getting the 3 pn uh, 3 pn uh, zygotes on day 1 so do you think uh, the number of the sperms to be inseminated, they can be lowered in the, in this uh, situation. Yeah, yeah, three pn post IVF insemination is understandable. I've 
was presuming that you were having uh, this conversation for uh, ek post XC because uh, abnormal CP. No, it's for IVF. Yeah. Oh, polyspermy post IVF is uh, usually due to uh, higher inseminate volume and perhaps uh, if you had a lesser spread, but of course, uh, even objectively measured uh, spermatozoa would sometimes result, and you have that, that's why you have a, a threshold of uh, what six percent uh, polyspermy, three to six percent uh, in the KPI because you would encounter this with uh, the exact objective inseminate volumes as well. For so, is KPI, there uh, sorry to interrupt, but then do you think there is a failure of the cap? I mean, the cortical reaction. Therefore, I mean, why should a high inseminate volume? So what is going wrong with the cap here? See, because we are discussing everything in relation to the acrosome. So what could be going wrong in case of uh, uh, polyspermy? Oh, perhaps uh, I've never thought about this uh, food for thought, but perhaps what is happening is it is differing from in vivo wherein we still have a uh, uh, few thousands of uh, spermatozoa come in, con in contact with the cumulus surrounded. Uh, so uh, here what you're having is perhaps a little higher inseminate volume and even the uh, past block to polyspermy is not fast enough to prevent the entry of uh, two sperm. I am yes. not thought about it, uh, but yes, I always attributed it to mm -hmm. higher inseminate volume. Yeah. But yeah, uh, 3 p.m. following ICSI, uh, perhaps uh, you have to look at uh, the timing of uh, the in uh, XC, perhaps you're injecting a telophase or prometaphase one, whose sides we perhaps have extruded the first polar body, but they're still not uh, uh, nuclear, uh, met, the maturity is not uh, complete as it. Uh, uh, sorry uh, to interrupt here. Actually, don't you think that there will be problem with cytoplasmic membrane of whose sides in case of polyspermia? The zona, zona you mean? Yeah, yeah. Just in case, as yeah. mentioned in my uh, slide, huh? the poly to avoid the polyspermy, it is uh, there are two mechanisms that the oocyte follows. One is immediately after the uh, entry of the first sperm into cortical the cortical reaction. No, that it, is the no, part of, before cortical reaction, then uh, cortical reaction is the second part, which second is part, two, which is called the slow uh, process for the to avoid the polyspermy. The first one is the fast one, and here. This is particularly meant to avoid the entry of the sperm, which have already halfway through already entered into the sperm. Because many times we see, you know, next day when we see the pronuclear fertilization part of it, many sperms, they are attached to the zona and they are attached to the zona at different layers. Few sperms, we can, which we can see, almost they have touched the inner part, you know, the, near the uplasm part of the zona, uh, you know, uh, of, the, of the sperm entered into that level. So this is the first reaction where the zona structure, so bi biochemically it is changed. So the sperm gets trapped there and it will not enter inside. And the second, as we mentioned, is the uh, cortical, cortical where mm. this is particularly made for the, from the ulema part of it. it the, the, the fusion of the sperm head to the ulema is prevented using this uh, cortical gram reaction. Now this is as far as the physiological part is concerned, but there is genetic part is also concerned where after XC, when you see the three pronuclei, then there is a genetic gene expression is involved. You know, there can be either oopsite itself, the, the, um, the, the gene expression is extra gene expression from the oocyte point of view, or otherwise, the second polar body, which is supposed to be released into the periwinkle space, if that remains inside the oplasm, that yeah. may also result in the formation of a third pronuclei, which is a very tiny pronuclei. So these are the things. I was just curious to know if someone has tried removing this, uh, you know, smaller pronuclei and then see the development of the, you know, that uh, particular embryo. Is yeah, there... I, I have done many uh, years back uh, looking into one paper from uh, Singapore, but I didn't transfer that embryo, though embryo developed till day three, because that time we were doing till cleavage stage only, but... Uh, I didn't have that courage to transfer the embryo because I had some other uh, normal PN embryos also. But mm -hmm. just to, uh, you know, how that embryo is surviving or not after removing the third one and all that. For that, I have done and it has survived also and it is cleaved also. It, so it, you it, did the it, regular it, biopsy yeah, to remove? Uh, no, it? yeah, it, with the injecting needle only, you know, kind of uh, have, uh, removed that. 
Oh, yeah. That's there is one paper of Dr. Chen from Singapore. Uh, many years back, I studied that paper and from that I got that. Interesting, see? Yeah. Okay. So I think and there is one pregnancy also. There is one paper that after removing them to triploidy one pn, there is one healthy birth also. That is also oh. only the only issue is whether you are removing the right pronoun. Correct, 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 correct. So how to identify? There is some step mm -hmm. now. I am not remembering because uh, generally even after ICSI, we have it is not that only one oocyte we have, so we do not consider uh, to transfer that. Right. Did it reach to blastocyst stage? No, no, no. Stage. Yeah. And you what, discarded it later? Yeah, or discarded. You, you still no, have it discarded. frozen? No, okay. no, discarded. Okay. Interesting. I think we should share, <coughs> let the group remain, share all these papers. I mean, these are, yeah. uh, um, I mean, case studies kind of things. Yeah, it, is okay. a, it was a case study. Yeah. Okay, so now let us talk about how uh, we are going to select the sperm based on the acrosome um, intactness or uh, how do we go about the sperm selection for ICSI on, based on the acrosome or hyaluronic acid method. So, uh, Charu, you were not there for the previous one. Maybe you can take this Sorry, up. Sorry, because Parag, I had a submersion call from the... Yeah, yeah. So, that's... Uh, yeah. I so, uh, Dr. Parag and Dr. Charu can take up. Prana has spoken enough. Wait. <laughs> so, uh, here one is Pixie where you can, uh, you know, select the sperm uh, according to the hyaluronic binding uh, thing. Uh, that is one is the answer where uh, sperm can be selected. The two advantages that that maybe the sperm which is selected it is the intact DNA, but again the Cochrane analysis and all that is not in kind of too much of favor that Pixie um, treated uh, sperm selected from the Pixie dish or the without that makes any difference in terms of the live birth rate. But again that method is there. Okay, anyone wants to add, Doctor Parak? Uh, I personally uh, do not uh, use PIXI, uh, but uh, <coughs> yes, the the theory behind it may be uh, useful. Uh, I prefer, you know, I I uh, either uh, magnetic assert, uh, you know, that that one is Max. okay. But I have not I have not uh, used that uh, this particular okay. PIXI. So, okay, anyone? Uh, Pranay, uh, Dr. Vijay, sir? No, I also want to keep my uh, workflow lean and I'm a proponent of evidence-based me medicine. So unless something uh, comes to uh, pass through the rigor of uh, EBM and be as established as ICSI vitrifications uh, until unless I'm not going to be willing to uh, explore any of these. Though the uh, hypothesis is that the mature spermatozoa, they will express hyaluronin receptors. And if you uh, select these sperms by the use of a physiological ICSI dish, the PIXI dish on which you have hyaluronin microdots, the mature spermatozoa will bind to it and you can pick up the bound spermatozoa, that is one, or you can use a hyaluronin enriched media, which is goes by the name of a commercially available sperm slow, and it works on the same principle. Uh, in theory, it is supposed to work and it does so in uh, sporadic studies, but again, uh, RCTs and meta-analysis and Cochrane do not support the, uh, support the use of these uh, sperm sorting methods. Okay, anyone who wants to add up anything to this overall I mean, discussion? There is another uh, very uh, method uh, which is also there in the WHO manual for the sperm selection and as well as preparation. What they have done is in the kind of capillary, they have taken the cumulus cells, vast and uh, in that cumulus cells, they uh, in a 45 degree angle, they kept the prepared sperm in one kind of uh, small, you know, tube. And the sperm which is migrate through uh, cumulus. cumulus and that they have used for ICSI and they found that uh, the blastocyst formation rate is better than the uh, without, you know, kind of, uh, so cumulus has their own, uh, you know, to select the sperm which is, so that is also one of the sperm preparation. Is there. So probably it increases the motility because of the progesterone. Correct. Uh, yeah. Hmm. So it acts as a chemotactic. Chemo 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 uh, yes, effect. absolutely. Okay. Okay. So, maybe maybe Max can also be a tool because yes. it has a wonderful uh, science uh, involved in it. 
magnetic activated cell sorting can be a good tool which can give a well healthiest spermatozoa yeah it's the best i uh, hope it is affordable to all yeah <laughs> yeah that is the big challenge yeah so okay to end uh, to a futuristic tool that we all have artificial intelligence and um, so it there was a very good uh, facebook uh, post by dr swami today where we all are dealing with human stupidity and artificial intelligence so how many here are uh, the proponents or believe in uh, uh, introducing artificial intelligence big time in reproductive uh, science or uh, infertility in particular so any experiences or any uh, hope for ai for sperm selection for icsi in the future uh, maybe we'll uh, wait till the robotic bots will come to select the sperm in icsi dish <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. i think it is already a reality now that uh, you yeah. can in uh, real time in your pvp drop <laughs> have a priority uh, gradation of the spermatozoa and you will have numbering of uh, or the ranking of the spermatozoa with regards to the outcome in terms of fertilization potential and uh, i think it it was pre i think showcased at the previous ace uh, wherein you had a demonstration of a real time robotic selection of sperm yeah for... it is there yeah basically when, amalgamation of yeah sorry. robotic is there again yeah. there is will be uh, gamete uh, selection through ai that platform will be there now there is a blastocysts one is there everyone knows that there is a blastocysts when you select and even for the gamete two site also there is one company But, who has come up so maybe in the sperm also based on the kinetic uh, parameters and the uh, you know velocity or okay. kernel velocity based on that also ai platform might come any day that uh, of course there are papers to, yeah. yeah there are papers where they have those proper networking systems yeah. the, uh, programs in place uh, softwares where uh, oocyte as well as sperm selection uh, yeah. is done through ai and yes they they are uh, getting results promising also but then i deliberately left this slide blank uh, to see whether i mean anyone uh, has any good hope with ai in the near future yeah. i think with this uh, anyone who wants to yeah. add anything in the nutshell yes. about everything that has been discussed till now in bindu the thing is that uh, with ai ai is no doubt it is an uh, very very promising platform as such and the future but we have to realize the limitations of the ai yes. see ai will tell us the information based on what we feed ai will never take anything on its own and feed if we have to apply as far as the sperm is concerned there are many openings there are many opportunities that it can be utilized but one simple example i can tell you see for example if you want to study that whether a sperm population you know has the dna fragmentation in it or not now the thing is for that matter what what is to be fed to the ai machine is how many of the sperm they have a typical pattern where with or without dna fragmentations now who is going to do this and then give feed this to the ai machine it is it is required it is it is it will be extremely helpful to us that if we can get this information then while doing xc without exposing it to any stains then we can we will be able to select it but it has its limitation as i told you if we can and it can be of course used for other purposes like sex selections and all these things the, the motility pattern of the sperm yes. how fast a male you know carrying sperm moves from the from the droplet there are different aspects the, there are many ideas present in it but all these information first we have to check it on the sperms and then we have to feed it to the ai then only the ai will be able to give us the information yes yes obviously so, i mean ai will be is to be manned by a human being a human you have brain to feed, eventually yeah, yes you have to feed the information to the machine then the machine will Correct. Correct. machine will at the most do 2 plus 2 yes. it may not yes. necessarily do till 1 now, plus 3 till now we do not know even that the whether the uh, you know which one is the egg getter sperm is there the you know the fast moving sperm or the you know slow moving sperm we do not know exactly so whatever the information will be will be accumulating will be feeding that thing and what machine does that it will be doing they very fast they will be calculating the thing and they will be doing the repeating job they will be doing fast mm -hmm. that's the ai Uh, yeah. i think the integration of casa with the you know uh, in real time uh, that is uh, because i have used um, uh, a long uh, 
way that Casa I have used. So if the integration, the kinematics that would be used to in that the live spam catching and all this, uh, I have seen in the ACE what Pranay was saying, like that that thing. Uh, if if it really comes, uh, then that would be really helpful to. Uh, yeah, admit. more than AI, yeah, I feel that that cap score test should be available. Yeah. You know, that will be a little more. Uh, <laughs> but see, the thing is, Charu, cap score, all right. But then how do we select out of that? See, Correct. it's like DNA no, the fragmentation basic index, idea we can get, find out. Yeah, yeah. Basic but then idea out of that, that, which one is the DNA? I mean, intact one. Yeah. That we should be able to select. Absolutely. That's the basic form selection. So that's basic why that is this, this cap score test, which, uh, which is very much uh, used in USA, uh, that that uh, has a very good uh, prediction for IUI rather than ICSI because uh, timed IUI can be <coughs> planned and IUI, it, it helps, CAP score helps in uh, planning of the IUI timing and that improves IUI outcome significantly. Uh, that is the biggest advantage of the CAP score. It, it And based on that CAP score, uh, of course, at least prognostic value for the IVF and ICSI can be slightly more valuable uh, for the patient part. Yeah, I mean, good. I mean, maybe we can, uh, if we can uh, extrapolate the findings of CAP score and uh, get better results in IVF and ICSI as well, not just IUI, maybe... Uh, that Actually, be when more... I was there in the ASR, they are Denver ASRM. Mm -hmm. There, I had the discussion with this team of uh, CAP score. This is a this is their patented, uh, and this has still not gone out of USA. Okay. Uh, Fifty dollar uh, test they are doing. CAP score is there in practice, okay. but. It is more useful for IUI uh, planning. I mean, timing of IUI can be, that is, that is the more highlight of their <laughs> uh, part. Yeah, maybe, but, I mean, if they let it come out of US, Indians will find a way to use it for other, uh, I mean, other, not uh, just IUI, for, for IUI yeah. fix as well. Okay, Correct. so I think that has been a really very interesting discussion. And um, maybe we have been ignoring sperm for a long time. Every single aspect of the sperm is important. And uh, sperm is equally big because we are talking of oocyte as well. So equally big player, whether with cap or without cap. So yes, sperm is a good player, a big player. And uh, it does make a huge difference to our IVF results. So yes, it's a sperm's world in the end. Thank you so much to all the panelists for making this panel such a wonderful uh, thing today. And uh, I mean, discussing just with respect to the cap or the acrosome, it has been really interesting. So thank you so much for your valuable inputs to each and every one of you. Rahul, if you want, you can add. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, uh, to conclude, I think uh, it was a wonderful discussion. And we had uh, uh, an elaborative discussion, not only on the uh, uh, acrosome part, but how this acrosome can uh, subsequently uh, involve and uh, uh, can contribute into the embryo development and uh, uh, later in the conception stages also. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Bindu ma'am, uh, for uh, moderating and uh, uh, taking this session so, uh, so well. And to all the panelists, for their inputs and uh, elaborative thoughts. So uh, so we are uh, concluding with this uh, panel discussion. Uh, I think, uh, wait sir, yes. Yeah, um, and if I may add, uh, I'm sure, I and I hope rather that all the people who have attended this webinar have learned something out of it. But we as moderators or panelists together as a part of this team, we have learned something, some new things, whether it is about the CAP course. score or whether uh, what uh, Charlata said about removing the extra pronucleus. Yeah. 
and uh, also what pranay uh, spoke about um, uh, 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 an experiment a case study and again i'll also probably share that paper about the plc zeta null sperm where uh, fertilization was achieved so yes some new studies some good research also we have learned and probably will share that and go ahead and uh, probably have better more uh, such webinars discussing on specific uh, cases also thank you so much dr ved and team dr sanjay shukla for having us do yeah this. thank you so much in fact uh, for this also you know it is so good that uh, we get chance to study again yes <laughs> yes really really i mean first when this topic was given i thought my god cap or without cap what exactly are we supposed <laughs> to do and we really had to rack our brains and head and cap and, uh, to, to really uh, go to this. So yes, it has been interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay sir, uh, Pranay, Parak sir, uh, uh, <coughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, I don't know why Dr. Dilip couldn't join and Dr. Hetal as well. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. You. Good night. Thank you. So thank much. you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Aishara. Thank you. I'll stop so sharing. Much, everyone. Yeah. Actually, it was wonderful discussion. Actually, and I have learned so many things from you people. Actually, that was the intention actually behind this because people are not taking it seriously that uh, is Pamna. That's why I thought why not to go about uh, one part, but one by one part of his pump to learn many things from uh, all our panelists, of course, from our that, uh, you know, that is speaker, but I don't know how he was first time he was uh, presenting in our uh, thing and I have shared him all the things ki how we are organizing the uh, our webinar but still it was good actually and i think everybody learned so many things from you people and i i myself learned so many things from you people thank you so much each thank and you. everyone for contributing and uh, making it success thank you so much thank, thank you. you thank you thank you and so much. Uh, here i want to share one more uh, thing from our side again we are organizing MBART 4, 4.0. That theme will be from research lab to embryology lab. So I'm looking forward to all uh, towards all of you, and definitely you will be inviting invited for that uh, uh, that conference, and it will be for two days again, uh, 18 November and 19 November. Thank is that online? Much. Yeah, it is online. It is online. It's online. So this time again in November. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All the best. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks to INTAF people who sponsored this uh, webinar for us. Thank you, thank sir. you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.